<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure and uh, an honor for us to have you here in Campinas. Uh, we hope we have a good stay here and we hope you enjoy all the conferences and all the activities that are linked to this uh, meeting. Uh, my name is Marcos Nolasco da Silva. I am in charge of the telemedicine network uh, here in Campinas at the State University of Campinas. And it's uh, an honor to have here Professor Latifi from University of Arizona, Professor Clenaldo from University, State University of Amazonas, and Professor Matos. And uh, I think we can start. And I would like also to acknowledge the kindness of the uh, faculty of the education staff who uh, helped us in setting up this meeting today with the, uh, this very beautiful and high-tech conference room. And I would like that everyone enjoy uh, this uh, day and have a nice day in Campinas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here, obviously, and uh, uh, my coming to Brazil has become a tradition. I have some great friends here. Uh, among them is uh, Professor uh, Costa, Fernando Costa, who has become <coughs> a very close friends on, on many levels. Uh, we work together on uh, different projects, and it's certainly uh, great. I uh, appreciate you all coming here today. I wish uh, we had uh, more people in the room, but I think uh, as, uh, as Professor Marco just told me a couple of minutes ago, we pay the price of being nervous and, and different. Uh, I think we will be different and I think we are going to help uh, more people than, than uh, a lot of other disciplines. Before I go on today uh, to, to introduce a program, we will see we have a pretty ambitious program. Uh, we're going to make it informal because we, it's a small group of people, so we'll just go and discuss issues. I, I want uh, Dr. Quinaldo Costa to say a few words as a co-director of this course. I had a great pleasure to see you today and uh, to invite Professor Latifi and other teachers to speak for us uh, all day about the telemedicine and telesurgery. I acknowledge uh, Professor Shao Lung Wen, Professor Rifat Latifi, and Professor Marcos Nolasco to uh, make the uh, design of this course for us. Uh, e, e é assim, com grata satisfação que eu venho aqui hoje tendendo esse honroso convite do grupo de trauma da Unicamp e aqui a oportunidade de participar com os colegas dessa experiência única de falar sobre telecirurgia, que é uma noção muito nova no nosso país, e ainda há poucos dias conversava com Gustavo Fraga sobre isso, e ele falava a questão de que ainda aqui no Sudeste essa noção é muito pouco difundida, em função das oportunidades que tem de intercâmbio muito próximo, muito direto. No nosso estado, isso é uma situação vital. Então hoje nós temos assim um razoável intercâmbio com a Universidade do Arizona, com o grupo de trauma da Universidade do Arizona, e outros grupos de trauma no Brasil e no mundo em função da necessidade. Um estado muito isolado da federação e a necessidade também de prover teleassistência. Então esse é um dos objetivos de nós estarmos conversando sobre telecirurgia e telesaúde hoje. E a oportunidade mais ampla ainda de integrar com novos grupos, com pessoas que nós poderemos formar uma nova rede, estruturar uma condição de segunda opinião, de conhecimento dessa nova tecnologia e principalmente de aplicação disso para as pessoas que vivem, que labutam no interior do nosso país. Então esse é hoje o nosso objetivo, estamos muito honrados de poder participar com essa estrutura aqui que o professor Gilberto e o professor Marcos Nolasco nos proporcionam. Então muito obrigado e que seja um dia muito produtivo para todos nós. Great. Well, thank you very much. We're going to start uh, uh, with the first lecture and for, because of this, my f first three lectures are, are our mind, what I'm going to do, I'm going to just run through, uh, and if you have any questions, just please, just raise your hand and we'll, we'll discuss. We're going to do this very uh, informal, uh, as I said before. Uh, perfect. So the first, the first 
thought, what I thought we should do, uh, I'm hoping that some of you, uh, I see some medical students here. Right, so what I thought we should do is to talk about uh, uh, course objectives, and obviously it's introduced the basic development of telemedicine. Uh, and if anyone doesn't understand, I can give you these slides to everyone, so it doesn't really matter. These are, you know, these are known facts. I have no intellectual property on this, so I could, you know, anyone can have these slides. Uh, to introduce telemedicine and e-health as applied to modern uh, healthcare and particular trauma and emergency management, that's really our main goal. And to learn some of the technological advances in medicine as it pertains to telemedicine and e-health. But before I go there, I just want to uh, thank one more time uh, all the faculties, especially Antonio uh, Martos, who came all the way from Miami uh, here. And uh, we have some outstanding faculty here, uh, some of them going to be virtual. Professor Ronald Merrill, Professor uh, Watson, uh, and Professor Poropatic, uh, who are, uh, number one, a great experts in telemedicine, and number two, great friends of mine. So uh, I think uh, we could give this course anywhere in the planet with thousands of people in a room, and we will be just fine. Um, <clears throat> so what we need is sort of to learn the tools of the trade. What do we really need to have telemedicine and how we need to do it from uh, uh, from the uh, internet provider, we need internet obviously, from some of the other technologies, ISDN, which we don't use much, but they're too expensive, wireless technology, satellite technology, and so on. Uh, more important is how can we pro create a system that will be sustainable? I was telling uh, um, Antonio that it's a guarantee that our room will be the best room that we present in conference on all the courses today because it's the highest tech. That's, we need to have high tech room to have something like this. Uh, but how can this be sustainable in the long term? We need a business aspect of telemedicine. We cannot ignore it. And uh, we need to learn how to provide distance learning and e-health education. I mentioned some of the faculty, and, uh, and I'm grateful for, for those to be here. However, my main goal of this, and the um, goal of uh, our uh, <clears throat> both Dr. Marcus, uh, Dr. Uh, Chen, and uh, Dr. Costa, was to really, when we put this program together, to develop this, champions. We need to have some champions among it. It's okay that we have only 10 people here. Because if we make 10 champions out of this, these are 10 Maradonas. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm in the wrong country. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you guys sleep it, okay? <laughs> so if we have 10 uh, champions, then we are, we really doing good, okay? That's going to be really... And, and how can we make this part of the... The reason I said Maradona, because I just heard the news, he went back to Argentina to work. <laughs> Uh, to be to make this integral part of our practice, uh, dreams and goals, where we serve uh, injured and sick patients. And because it's the first lecture, I, I thought I should run you through some because some of the young people here forget that we actually, until 1900, we didn't even have telephone. So 1900 telephone was introduced. Then on uh, 1914. Uh, <clears throat> We had uh, radio communications, 1920. Uh, we had actually hospital uh, in Norway was using radio links with ships. So it's some kind of form of telemedicine. 1924 radio news pr prediction that will be uh, tele telemedicine. And 1929 television was introduced. So here's those, uh, the radio uh, communications, 1914. Uh, this is a pretty high-tech hospital. Uh, uh, Hockland Hospital in Norway uses radio links with ships, as you can see it here. Uh, 1924, a cop, uh, uh, cover page on the radio uh, news was <coughs> <coughs> that there will be a radio doctor. And it will be actually the front. So a, a doctor will see you on television. And as you can see, this is pretty... Pretty great vision for someone to have that long, long time ago. And obviously, uh, finally, television came 1929. It took about 90, many years later, so 55 years after the telephone was discovered, that Nebraska Psychiatric Institute began using closed circuit television for telemedicine. 
So really this is the first time that telemedicine was used in medicine or television was used for telemedicine is 1965. Uh, 1964, uh, this institute started with another hospital telemedicine and hopefully, and, and by this time telemedicine was born. Uh, you all know the Logan, uh, famous Logan Airport in Boston, uh, United States. Uh, and in 1967, the Massachusetts General Hospital actually started a microwave connection with Logan Airport and began medical <coughs> consultation for travelers. Uh, I guess even then there was big traffic in uh, between the airport and, and the Massachusetts. So this was one of the first in part. And then I see a mistake there, historical, but so uh, in... Uh, Obviously, in 1961, uh, Yuri Gagarin uh, had his vital signs reported by the new technology and telemetry back home while he was circling the world. So it, 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 is, it was a, a quite, a, quite impressive. <clears throat> From 1972 to 1975, NASA supported a, a demonstration project in Arizona called Space Technology Applied to Rural Papayo Advanced Healthcare using microwave transmission, connecting a mobile health unit to a public health hospital for consult consultations. This, for as far as Arizona is concerned, this is one of the first times that telemedicine was used. It kind of really put uh, in place the foundations for major network that you're going to see a little bit later on. Uh, so this is a map of Arizona, and I mean, this is Indian Health uh, Services uh, map. 1974, NASA established a basic requirement for video quality declaring acceptable 200 lines or a rate of 10 frames per second as a minimal configuration. Look at this, so 10 frames per second. Look at this one, today, 1 million frames per second. Our, our high-speed video camera and its application was just published in 2005, so basically, Maybe by now it's more than 1 million. So from 10 frames, we went to 1 million frames per second. So the technology is amazing. Uh, it's amazingly advancing. Then uh, in 71, Alaska was one of the first countries, uh, w one of the first states in the United States to uh, have telemedicine linked uh, through the satellite uh, 27, 26 sites for the purpose of medical support, again, to support Indian Reservation's uh, medical s s state. It's needed for a lot of things. Uh, just imagine uh, in those days with these, these uh, ships, when they left the, the, uh, the country, they were on their own, and there was really nothing else to do except if someone got sick, if they have a doctor, they died, or they were helped, whatever, but there's nothing else to do. So now it's not there anymore, and this is just one of the sinking ships. Just you can imagine the disaster that happened there. And then the earthquakes. These happen on a daily basis, unfortunately. Uh, and, and, and telemedicine, one of the, uh, one of the first times that telemedicine was used, actually, was a program from Yale University, where I graduated uh, a few years ago, uh, that had Armenia Bridge. When Armenian uh, country was hit by an earthquake, uh, a group of Yale uh, faculties used telemedicine to try to help uh, that country. And then for trauma, and that's what we're going to talk about most of the day, most of the day today, so I will not uh, speak much much right now. Uh, when it comes to trauma, telemedicine actually started in 1978. So although we have activated now and we're doing it pretty good, uh, both in in different parts of the world, uh, the uh, 1978 experiment that was uh, done, uh, they proposed a regional disaster plan uh, and they used uh, telemedicine actually as a triage way. And this, what happened, this is Dr. Adams Crowley, Cowley, and uh, this is, uh, 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 these slides are actually given to me by Professor uh, <coughs> Moll. So they, what they did, they simulated the airplane crash. There were 72 casualties. Uh, 
And they, what they did, they did unseen command station, tribe transport, and they had seven hospitals around the region. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, here in Richmond, Virginia, when I used to work in the past. And this is a plane uh, that was simulated uh, as, a, as a disaster. Uh, these were actually pictures from 1978, so pretty darn good. So they could see the level of burns and so on, and all, the, all of this simulation to see if telemedicine can be, can be used. Uh, and this is from the television inside the tent, which is black and white, as you can see. Uh, so it's uh, uh, somewhat difficult to, to distinguish how many, what is the uh, depth of burn, but nonetheless, it was, it was done. And then after this took many years, uh, until 2009, two, I'm sorry, 2001, when uh, laparoscopical hysterectomy was performed from New York uh, in Strasbourg, France. And uh, uh, basically, uh, what it show that it doesn't really matter. The difference in geography is meaningless. So you can you can uh, operate, you can do anything you want anywhere in the world. So there's no more no more uh, differences. And then came robotic surgery. So this kind of opened up, uh, and and this is uh, uh, basically uh, Dr. Alvari who does uh, Nissen fund applications and other operations in in uh, Canada. Uh, 300 kilometers away. So the patient is 300 kilometers away. He's here. He does an instant fundal application and surgery and so on. So that's a really true uh, telesurgery. And then in 2007, we did uh, uh, what we should have never done before. Uh, we did the Amazon Swim Telemedicine Expedition, uh, where Martin Strell uh, swam the Amazon River uh, from Atalaya, Peru, all the way to Belém, Brazil, and we followed him through telemedicine from Tucson, Arizona, from around the world. Uh, this is from the technology has become really small, as you can see. Uh, this is me in the Amazon River, and this is the satellite which connected us to the world. And uh, Professor Costa gave a lecture. Uh, actually, I was we were in Manaus and given a lecture. We connected directly on the boat with the. Uh, Martin Strell, the swimmer, and, uh, and the doctor, De Leon Stanonek. So this is beautiful Amazon. I love this part of the world. Uh, can I apply for citizenship here? I just need to come over here. I guess I don't need if I have enough friends. Uh, <clears throat> but all of these results are great. However, our, our medicine did not follow other industries. Each of us in our pockets have a credit card. We can go to any bank and get money. Why can't we have health care delivered that way as well? Uh, air travel system, banking system had gone much further up than, than we in, in medicine. Uh, so basically, we practice new medicine with old tools. Uh, medicine still operates primarily with paper-based records. We doctors and nurses have to manage 21st century medical technology and complex medical information with the 19th century tools. Medical professionals are the best and the brightest in the world, and we need to set the standards for the world. And it is a testament to our skills that we are able to achieve high quality care in this antiquated system. So what is our solution? Well, our solution is really to have a health information technology. We need electronic medical records, computerized ordering of prescriptions, uh, clini clinical decision support tools, and secure exchange of authorized information, which will improve quality, reduce medical errors, and prevent deaths. One of the uh, uh, best examples of this that Ant Dr. Antonio Marcos will talk, Mar will talk about is virtual intensive care unit, uh, where one intensivist can care for more, um, many units at the same time, and has been proven to reduce mortality, increase productivity, evidence-based medicine practice, and so on. And they're just an uh, illustration of that. Other examples, uh, when the patient's allergies, medical history, and so on, they all can be uh, really put in a, in a chip or in a medical electronic medical record. X-rays, we all know now, we don't have to go anymore to the radiology to get those x-ray to see, but we can see them on a, on a computer, on any computer for that matter. Some of the great examples for this are really teleradiology, uh, telelaboratories, all the number, all the labs are in, in a electronic form, and obviously telepharmacy. They're just a, a, 
uh, fictitious practice in incorporation, just a, a copy of uh, a made up uh, medical record thing. Uh, other issues uh, are basically when you go to the emergency room, uh, you have everyone knows what's wrong with you. Most of the common problem we have actually is by not having information on a patient. So this will this will help us a great deal. <clears throat> so, but there's only one requirement that we need to do. It's good to have all these champions in this room, but we need broadband with high-speed internet. Uh, a lot of div governments around the world are taking uh, uh, taking initiatives to do this. Uh, I think Brazilian government is doing a great job in uh, promoting telemedicine and initiatives, uh, as, as uh, documented by many initiatives here. Uh, and hopefully, we'll be able to roll uh, to roll uh, out new broadband technologies in every part of the world. I think it is important to have these because it will improve the nation's economic productivity uh, and will enhance our economic competitiveness that will improve education and health care for all Americans. And Americans, I mean uh, all Americans. Uh, in the United States, uh, we have some facts. Uh, broadband uh, in the United States is always on, uh, allowing the computer to remain connected to the Internet 24 hours a day, and uh, that's sort of one price. Uh, it's becoming cheaper and cheaper every day to have these uh, these uh, broadbands on. So, my friend, uh, the gap between imagination and accomplishment has never been smaller in, in my lifetime and in your lifetime. And I think we can do really most of the things. What we need to do is this. I put this slide a lot around the world. We need to dream. We have to uh, have to be creative. Uh, we need to be determined to do these things. We need to have passion. It would have been much easier for all of us to be somewhere on a beach today or, or in a bar or having a good time, but we are here working, and uh, we need to be lucky. So what do we need? We need a plan. We need a business plan. And for us doctors and medical students and others, somewhat is not uh, always uh, easy to think of a business plan because we just think we just need to take care of a patient, but we actually need a business plan. We need a team, a team that is really, really important to have, and we need money for it. Uh, we need to make telemedicine a part of our practice. Just on a regular basis, you go to a clinic, you see patients somewhere else, and we cannot. This is one thing you cannot do just by yourself. You know, right here we have a, an our engineer working pretty hard to connect us around the world, and so on, and. You know this, but uh, justify this to anyone. Anyone who asks you why you're doing it, take your time and explain why you're doing it. We as a surgeons are very impatient. You know, we just say, done it. Because you know how we do it? We In the operating, we extend our hand like this, and the instrument is in your hand. You don't ask, you don't do anything. So we expect everything in the world in our life to be like that. It's not like that. You know, you go home and you said, can I have some cup of tea? And you expect your wife to bring you tea right there. Uh -uh. You have to say, honey, please, can I have a cup of tea? Uh, so do do that. Uh, justify to everyone. Make it all inclusive. And don't forget that you are the champion. So analyze your situation. Be critical but fair. Find a solution. Be visionary. Try to, do the, to be the best in the world. Technology is a solution. Adopt it. Spread it and help develop it. Okay, uh, but so let's just uh, get out, let's get to work and never give up a dream just because time, it will take time to accomplish it. Remember, time will pass anyway. So you, you need to just keep doing it. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next, uh, to the next uh, topic, which is uh, some of the technologies that we have. So we know a little bit of history, now we're gonna know what, what is the technology down there. And I want to uh, thank uh, my uh, research fellow, George Hadid, and Mike Holcomb, who's our uh, network engineer, uh, for helping me with this, uh, with this talk. Obviously, they know the technology. I just know the benefits of technology. Okay. And we should all know that. So, we, again, let's go back to the plain old telephones uh, that we had. Uh, it's, you know, voice-grade service with limited data transfer capability. 
used primarily for voice calls, fax, and home health uh, device connectivity as we, uh, we have it, and available in most areas of the world, frankly, uh, allowed for basic telemedicine services that only require a relatively small amount of data to be transmitted. Uh, we did a, an experiment, actually, uh, Dr. Ron Merrill uh, uh, was in uh, uh, one of the branches of the Amazon in Ecuador, and we did the lab coli in a, in a uh, uh, truck, and we were broadcasting it through plain old telephone. We had 64 uh, kilobits uh, broadband, not broadband, very limited band, and we were able to see the issue was that when two of us will talk, the picture will get blurred. So we had to talk only one at a time, and and you know, and they operate a lot of people talk at the same time, so we could not see it. But it, it's doable, so you can, if you want to do it, you can do it. Uh, there are some pros about this. Uh, it's ubiquitous uh, through most of the world in the both home and office settings. Relatively inexpensive. Uh, well suited for sending uh, small bytes of information, plain text, email, small documents, low resolution photos, and so on. The, the cons are data transfer speed is 56 kilobits per second maximum, usually less. Uh, very limited video conferencing capability. Connection can be broken or interrupted easily. Not usually and always on connection. I.e. must uh, dial to ISP or another computer. And uh, these are the telephone lines. Uh, we don't see them anymore unless you leave the big cities and you go into some, some village. Uh, ISDN, uh, it's another form of uh, communication uh, or digital uh, integrated services delivery, a digital telephone network. Basic rates of ISDN is about 128 kilobits per second, but it can go up to uh, 512, can bond multiple uh, bridges line to increase bandwidth, excellent for video conferencing. Popularity is dwindling due to high cost versus internet communication. It's very expensive. When we started our program, a telemedicine program in the Balkans, we were using ISDN, and it was very expensive. Uh, so we finally changed to, to uh, other to internet. Uh, pros is stable and reliable connectivity because it's a pipe that you send information through. Uh, good video conferencing quality at 384. Uh, at 512, you can basically operate and you can see anything you want. So it's pretty pretty good. Sufficient for store and forward application, and it's widely available. Uh, the problem is that it's very costly. And not always in connection, uh, it charges per minute, and may apply in some instances, and that's not, not good. That's just how it looks for you to see it. Uh, DSL is another one, another form. This is digital subscriber line. Works uh, over existing telephone wires. Available in most urban areas, limited rural areas, unfortunately. Uh, simultaneous voice and data transmission uh, can provide always on true bandwidth high speed internet. Speeds range from 128 kilobits to 3 megabits, depending on type of DSL. Uh, supports high resolution video, audio, and data transfer, requires the use of special hardware and filters. It's a true broadband, so it's, it's pretty good for that. It's over 256 kilobits per second, widespread in uh, urban uh, locations. It's always on. An idea for large store and forward files, as well as high resolution video conferencing. And uh, most of the homes in uh, cities around the world have it, uh, as well as office settings. What's the problem with that? It requires special hardware and phone filters to preserve signal quality. Monthly service can be quite expensive. Speeds and availability decrease the further you are away from DSL provider. Uh, network systems can be more prone to hackers since the connection is always on, and upload speeds may not support video conferencing. So it's a there are some issues. That's how it this would look. <coughs> uh, this is the DSL modem. Cable internet. Uh, internet connectivity through cable uh, TV wires, extremely fast download speeds, 2 megabytes per second and higher depending on, this, on the speed uh, tier chosen. Always on true broadband speed connection, so it's, it's pretty good. 
uh, available in most areas where the take cable TV is available, supports high resolution video, audio, data, downloads, uh, ideal for downloading or streaming large amounts of information. Uh, so the pro pros for, for this is obviously clearly extremely fast download speeds. You know, I got yesterday uh, Dr. Um, Watson's uh, lectures just in case we cannot connect with them within less than a minute. Both of his lectures will be uh, close to an hour of lecture in less than a minute downloaded in a computer. That's pretty fast. Good for large to forward files and video conferencing and predominant mostly in a home, limited availability in the offices uh, for the most part. It's, some of the problem with this is shared by other users in a geographical area. Upload speed typically much slower than download speeds. Can be expensive depending on the amount of bandwidth needed. That's uh, just a cartoon of this. <clears throat> Uh, cable modem, uh, we all have them. <clears throat> and uh, then we have dedicated T carrier lines, T1, T3, and so on. Uh, one of our programs that we use in, uh, in Arizona Telemans program is actually we run through the T lines, uh, T3 lines. It's a business uh, hospital grade internet connection, <clears throat> extremely fast, supports simultaneous high bandwidth applications. Uh, able to transmit high definition video, can be bonded with other T1, T3 lines to increase bandwidth, very reliable, always on connection, and at very little downtime. So if you have to pick something to have, uh, this is pretty darn good to have, and then you have your own highway, so to speak. Uh, so it's fast, downtown is very rare, uh, supports high definition content, can be connected to a server to host information and file with other computers. It's expensive to run and to maintain, so you need people to, to know how to do this. It requires expensive installation, typically used only in the large organizations. And then we have fiber optic uh, cables. You know, they're everywhere. I don't know how these people can, can know which, which what, what is what. And then we have satellite uh, internet. So allows for connectivity from virtually anywhere, provide true broadband access to anywhere, uses satellite technology to transmit and receive signals from space. Newer satellites are smaller and mobile as one as I showed you and I'll show it again. Download speeds are typically much greater than upload speeds. Uh, it's portable, so you can basically move anywhere. Uh, you see these uh, media organizations, uh, they have obviously they have big satellite, but they can put it anywhere you want and they get connected. Uh, some of the portable ones that are, are, I really like these portable ones, and obviously supports a low bandwidth video conferencing and store and forward application if you have to use it. Uh, it has high uh, latency due to physical distance, the signal has to travel because it has to go up and down. Uh, then typically bandwidth is rationed by limited and uh, or limited and kind of it's expensive. Very expensive initial startup and maintenance cost. Hardware is expensive and must be purchased. Uh, when we were in Amazon uh, River, uh, for each megabyte that was broadcast transmitted, we paid seven dollars. And uh, it came out to the when uh, my accounting saw the telephone line it came under telephone. $7,000. He called me and said, what is this phone that you're using? You pay $7,000 in one month. Well, it was, it was a damn satellite thing. So that's, that's how this works. Uh, it's just a cartoon that you can see it on that screen over there. <clears throat> and satellites are everywhere in the world. You can, you can see, you can go in any country in the planet. Uh, and they may, not have tele they may not have anything, but they will have a satellite and a TV and watching uh, a soccer game. So uh, the hospital has nothing, but the houses, the homes, they have satellites. So it's kind of amazing. And I always thought, why can't we use these satellites to provide health care to these homes? If we can use, uh, for if CNN is there and, and uh, ESPN and uh, Telemundo is there, why can't we just go there ourselves? Something is not right. Oh, so this began, this, this, that's a broadband global area network or, or satellite that uh, I used. Again, this is the same picture. This was in the spring of 2007. 
<coughs> we actually initially brought this huge uh, satellite. It was six uh, feet, so it was sorry, the two meters. And we had like 10 soldiers, 10 Peruvian soldiers to help us put it in a, in a, in a boat. But then if the boat was moving, we didn't have signal. So what we need to do is stop the boat and have signal. So we got rid of it. We couldn't, we couldn't take it anymore. Uh, we got this small satellite. <clears throat> Other uh, mobile uh, internet uh, or cellulars, obviously they come in pretty handy. We all have these small phones and smartphones and camera phones and, and so on. So uh, you, all, you all have them in your pocket. They're flexible to connect to the internet from anywhere. Uh, PDAs and smartphones can be used for their full potential of sending pictures, videos, emails, uh, Skype calling, uh, GPS, etc. True broadband access and so on. Uh, it has some limited network coverage. Obviously, you have to have network coverage to, to be able to use this. Uh, unlimited data plans are expensive and require mandatory yearly contracts, high latency, and so on. Uh, so you see these uh, signs everywhere you go in the, in the world. These are some of the smart smartphones uh, using cellular broadband networks. Uh, I'm sure they are everywhere we have. Mobile brand broadband PC card brings high-speed internet to your laptop. And we're actually using, we're going to test this one for uh, trauma emergencies in the, in the ambulances. We have a different system in, in Arizona, but we're going we're to start practicing with this one too. So let's just put this all kind of uh, in together. Uh, POTS are telephone lines based, inexpensive, available everywhere. ISDN is faster than POTS, uh, can support video conferencing lines, uh, can be bonded. DSL always on connection, always available in most areas, support video conferencing. Uh, cable, if you have, uh, uses ex existing cable TV wiring, fast downloads, always on. T lines uh, are dedicated toward these are expensive uh, to maintain. Satellites have high speed connection and cell broadband high speed connection via cell towers. Uh, what's wrong with them? Uh, we talked about before POTS limited uh, bandwidth. ISD are not, really, not a true broadband connection but uh, must dial out for internet limited by telephone infrastructure. Uh, Cable uh, bandwidth dedicated by amount of users. T1, T3, as I said before, extremely expensive. Satellites expensive and probably not, not very good uh, unless you really have to use them. And cellular phones, hopefully they will be good. So then we have, so you, you connect with them. Let's see. Uh, a couple of applications, a couple of ways we can do this. We can do telemedicine, what we call store and forward, uh, or we can do live. This is a store and forward is probably the best one is teleradiology, uh, teledermatology, telepathology, although this can be live and interactive. And then we have all real time, uh, allows the real time interaction for two or more parties, telesurgery. Typically, this is done through a video conference or teleconference. Uh, real time sharing of uh, images and data requires a low latency, reliable band, broadband connection to support transfer of audio, video, and data. Common software applications. Uh, there are a wide variety of software applications to support video conferencing and data sharing. Some are free to use, others require upfront purchase. Probably the best one that we all know as, as a free is Skype. How many of you use Skype? Yeah, I mean, I think like, what do you mean you don't have a tie? <laughs> yeah, of course you have a tie. Right? <laughs> Everyone uses Skype. I'll tell you what, since the Skype came in, our home bill, telephone bill went to zero. Because kids are in one part of the planet, and friends are everywhere, and it's really nice. And the good thing is you don't have to hold the phone when you talk to them. You know, you can do something in the office and keep still talking to your kids. Obviously, we, this is why we use Skype, right? <laughs> they have great commercials. Then there's some other uh, technologies like GoToMeeting, uh, real-time interactive online presentations, uh, share content, desktop, screen, chat, application, and so on. Uh, and you can really see a lot, of, a lot of things. These are for free. You can download them in your computer. Uh, you can have a slide presentation at the same time. And different people from different parts of the world can see the same screen that we've seen. So it's, it's pretty good. 
continued uh, medical education. Uh, obviously, through this, this is just one of the examples of the center we built in uh, the Balkans. And uh, I know you can see it, but here, uh, this is me in Arizona, and these guys are in Pristina, 10,000 kilometers away. And this is where Dr. Costa uh, and I, we had a teletrauma conference, uh, and it was a three a prong, it was uh, Manaus, Sao Paulo, and Pristina, and it was just really, really beautiful. And we discussed in the same patient. So you have all these experts discussing the same patients and what can happen to them. So it's the world is becoming just beautiful and very, very small in the same time. And obviously you can do the monitoring and so on. I will not uh, talk because Dr. Uh, will, Marcus will talk about this. Uh, EICU. Uh, he will go much more in details. Now, uh, no secret, you can uh, monitor everyone anywhere. Uh, and you educate people a lot. You educate your doctors that you're dealing with during this process. This is just an ICU video. So the possibilities really are endless uh, for all of this. Some other video applications uh, are, you know, you have to decide what it, what it works best for you and for your uh, technology people. But work with them very closely and they will uh, help you. There's some other programs uh, such as this, Polycom, which is Total Presence. Uh, these are expensive, uh, but are incredibly good. Uh, you feel like you are in the same room. You don't feel the, the difference. Uh, then uh, Tanberg basically are the same, all these different names, same principles. Uh, quite expensive to have them, uh, but it's much cheaper than flying executives from one side of the world to another one when you have meetings and so on. So uh, it's really, really good. Uh, I'm going to talk about this telemedicine program a little bit later on, so I'm going to skip it here. But uh, we do telepresence for trauma in, in Arizona. We do it pretty good. These are just some of the pictures uh, that we manage uh, over, the, over the network, and it's, it works really good. Uh, and this is going to be another video, so hopefully we'll be able to show this video when time comes. Okay, did I spell it correct? Yeah. I did, okay, good. I was afraid I did not. <laughs> All right. Any questions? So what are we going to do? I think maybe we can take, uh, if we have any minutes left, we can take a few minutes uh, break until we connect with you. Uh, with uh, We don't have time? There is time? Okay. Well, then we'll, uh, if you have no questions, then we'll connect with... Uh, uh, Dr. Watson. Okay. I don't know, uh, Andy, I don't know if you heard me, but if it's okay with you, I suggest that you do both lectures at once. Uh, so finish one and then uh, move to the next one. So you don't have to wait and come back sure. later on. Okay? But whatever you'd like to do, I am happy to come back later on. It's entirely up to you, sir. No, I think it will be, will be appropriate, Dr. Costa. Is that right? I think it will be okay if you just go ahead and give your lectures and move on with your day. I'm sure you have... A uh, million things to do today. How much time would you like me to take? As long as you want. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much for letting me speak. Um, I'm Andrew Watson. I'm a surgeon here at the University of Pittsburgh, and I specialize in uh, minimally invasive colorectal surgery. Um, I also started the Center for Telehealth here in Pittsburgh. Um, several of my colleagues are down there, Dr. Uh, Andrew Peisman, I think, is down there as well, who is the uh, president um, of the Pan-American Trauma Society, and he's also the president-elect of the American Association for Surgery and Trauma. And one of my other colleagues, Dr. Juan Carlos Puyana, is down there, who's spearheading um, our newly developed uh, international trauma efforts. And uh, but thank you very much, Dr. Latifi. Um, in terms of uh, telemedicine home care, I think this is going to be a very exciting topic. And the perspective of what I'm going to be doing will be from um, that of the United States, but it's applicable um, across the world. Um, we have found in the United States that there's going to be a tremendous shift in technology and a, a real enabling of home care in the, in the field of uh, telemedicine. We have seen a tremendous rise in the realm of portable devices. We have seen um, with the portability and the devices that are available, um, we're seeing uh, BlackBerry, Apple, and other devices come to the forefront of the marketplace. As you can see the picture here of the iPhone, who would have thought two to three years ago that we'd have a multi-touch device at our fingertips that we could use? Also Google. In the United States, we live on Google. And again, this is a relatively new development. If you look at these two, 
and wonder what would happen in the future, it's very hard to predict. But the portability of, of um, information currently is very exciting, but this is a fundamental enabling technology. We've also seen a tremendous rise in bandwidth here in the U.S. Dial-up modems and ISDNs that we used several years ago have been replaced with our standard, our standard of care, so to speak, um, which are DSL modems. Um, what we've also seen, especially in some of our neighborhoods, is the onset of fiber optic high-speed connectivity. We call this Fios. It's becoming more common. We're seeing bandwidths of 60, um, 60 megabits down, 20 megabits up for about $100 a month. The technology has also been enabled, and we've seen some uh, proof of concept from a company such as Voxiva. This is a company for the last five or ten years that's been using cell phone technology to track diseases and medications throughout the world. Uh, the, part, the person that leads this uh, initiative, uh, Paul Meyer, has offices across the world. He has offices in South America, offices in India, and it shows the power of portable devices and limited bandwidth in what we can do in the realm of healthcare. But the new possibilities that we're seeing, these are cost effective. The price is coming down dramatically. But what's most impressive too <clears throat> is what is going on with the hospitals. In the United States, I think that home care is gonna be driven by hospital pressure. Currently, hospitals are under real pressure for cost and quality. When a patient comes in, we get a set payment for that patient. Um, and if, you patient, if the patient stays longer, the hospitals actually lose money. And in terms of quality of care, this is a tremendous focus for all hospitals, but hospitals are now being rated. It's very possible that in the, five, the next five years that a patient coming to a hospital can go online and see what is the hospital's rating. If a hospital has bad outcomes, if a hospital has patients that are readmitted, if a, if a hospital has patients that has lots of complications, it's possible that the patients could go to another healthcare system. And I think this is going to happen in the next several years. Physicians also are under tremendous pressures right now. Uh, physicians are under pressure um, because of the outcomes. Our outcomes, like a hospital, will be put online. If you have wound infections, if you have leaks from your anastomosis, if your patients get readmitted, if your OR times are high, or if patients express dissatisfaction, it's very likely that the patients will look at this online and they may not come back to you. So why does all of this matter? If you look at the change in technology, the pressures on healthcare and the cost of healthcare, home care and home care and trauma has a real role in um, the future of healthcare in the United States and internationally. Trauma patients in particular are um, very fertile ground for home care. A trauma is an unexpected change in a patient's life. Unlike a planned abdominal surgery or neurosurgery or thoracic surgery, the patients do not anticipate this. They don't have time to prepare at home to get themselves ready, nor to get their families ready. Trauma patients can also be older. These are patients that are less likely to tolerate a significant change in their life. They may have less support, and they may have a harder time adjusting to new medications. And another unique feature about trauma patients is the remote care that patients get. If patients are in a small and rural and underserved area, and we fly them in sometimes 45 minutes by helicopter, which may be a two or three hour drive in the United States. Other patients can't be driven over an hour. So patients are taken out of the local community, out of their comfort zone to a remote area, which would be the tertiary care center. When patients are discharged to home or to rehabilitation, we are seeing this discharge faster. Because of the pressures I mentioned earlier, there's pressure on the hospitals and the physicians to get the patients out sooner. This means that you may have less follow-up care or there may be more need for you to follow these patients after they're discharged. And all of these are reasons why home care and trauma in particular is relevant. Trauma patients frequently have wounds. This could be an abdominal incision, it could be um, extremity wounds, it could be skin graft sites, it could be a vac dressing that you're, changed, that you're changing on a routine basis. If you could see these when the patients are at home, you could track the healing. There's no doubt that the medications and the new medication changes, as I said above, are hard for patients. So all of these are reasons why home care and the field of trauma, I think, is a very exciting area and also necessary. We have a model for this in congestive heart failure in the United States. 
Telemedicine in the United States is currently looking at chronic disease management. The several diseases that are tracking in particular. One would be congestive heart failure, one is diabetes, and one is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The reason why they're focusing on this in the United States is because of the fact that these patients are frequently readmitted. And again, these readmissions are expensive, it's hard for the patients, it increases their mortality potentially if they're getting hospital-acquired infections, but also, as I said before, the hospitals may not be reimbursed for this. It's not necessarily a successful model. What we've seen um, with telemedicine in the last one to two years, we have longitudinal studies being conducted. These studies are taking cohorts of patients and trying to match them in a case-controlled fashion, looking at what happens if you follow patients with telemedicine or not, and the results are actually quite fascinating. What we've seen, for example, congestive heart failure in a one-year period is up to a 200% increase in medication compliance. You can reduce the hospital cost by over 50%, and you can reduce the rate of rehospitalization by approximately 60%. And this, again, leads to success primarily for the patients, but it's also good for the physicians, and it's also good for the hospitals. <clears throat> how does this work? I think it's important to look at this process and see how you can enable this at home. I'm not sure how well you can see this picture, but in the center is a, is a rectangle called the Top Care Box. We do not use this, but it's an example of technology. That is a device that collects information. If you look in this circle here that surrounds the rectangle, and the second one down from the left is a pulse ox. Below that is a spirometer. You can check an INR. You can put someone's scale um, into this device. You can check their finger sticks, monitor their blood pressure, look at their urine, and track pill dispensers. It's very important that you realize the amount of data that we can gather from home almost potentially to excess. But all this information can be bundled together, given to the central box, and then transmitted to hospitals. But if you think about a trauma patient, you could look at their wounds, <coughs> excuse me, you can see what pills they're taking. If these are older patients and have medication changes, you can check their blood pressure. If they're diabetes, you can follow their finger sticks. If they have a history of heart failure, you can weigh them every day. All of this is relevant, and all of this is very exciting because if you look at this information, the home can actually be a step-down unit from an inpatient visit. This is an example of a portable device that was created by Glenn Hammock and the University of Texas Medical Branch. Um, the University of Texas Medical Branch, like the University of Arizona and Dr. Latifi, these are leaders in the world in the field of telemedicine. What Dr. Hammock did at UTMB aside from creating a, a very large, robust network, is to create devices as well. This is a portable suitcase that can go onto the overhead bin of an airplane. It's very lightweight, obviously. It's fully portable. What's impressive is, is its capability. If you look on the top of the suitcase, there's a PTZ, a pan, tilt, zoom camera, and a video screen for two-way audio-video communication. Off to the right is a small box that's open. That's a blood pressure cuff and the foreground is a coiled gray cord, which is a high-resolution camera. It can be an otoscope, an ophthalmoscope, it can take pictures of wounds, it can look at the larynx, it can capture data and transmit it back. In front also is a stethoscope. This can be battery-powered, and it can have a satellite uplink back to a central facility. But if you think of a visiting nurse having this or a, having a temporary remote office get set up for follow-up of trauma patients, this is a fundamental enabling device. It enables us to go out there and examine patients at home. So the, the support of technology for home care and trauma, one of the key pieces is connectivity. And there's three aspects to this. There's the home, the net, and the hospital. In the home, I showed you the previous diagram of the box with the various medical devices that are around it. Currently, we need to create a medical device library. Many companies are looking at this. Now, these small devices, be it a pill dispenser or a scale or a finger stick, these devices need to communicate, and there are multiple platforms looking at this. I think it's safe to say the leaders in this are Bluetooth and USB 2. They're looking at IDE specification for healthcare devices. Bluetooth is the wireless communication, which I think is preferable. If you have older patients and have wires all over their house, the more apt to fall, more apt to unplug. Bluetooth is more fail-safe in that regard. 
but these devices must gather this data and transmit it back to that central to box. Then that box interfaces with the internet. It could be your cable modem, it could be a satellite, it could be a cell phone, it could be broadband. There are a lot of different ways this could work, but once the data is captured, it's transmitted back to the hospital. One of the keys to this is how you set up the hospital. Hospitals have very robust firewall due to patient safety concerns. In the United States, we call it HIPAA, um, which is the Health and Insurance Portability Accountability Act. It basically means that patient data is sacred. It can't be breached. You can't have losses of data. So if you're having multiple patient homes connecting to the hospital's firewall, it can be a very tricky situation. NAT is a form of port forwarding. It's a way of enabling security. If you have a very specific port, the home device interacts with that port, it can then forward the data onto a secure server. To enable teletrauma and home care, one of the key aspects of this is the supporting technology within the hospital itself. And I think that the workflow routing is one of the hidden beasts of this process. It's critical that if the data comes into the hospital from 20 to 30 patients' homes who recently had trauma and you're trying to follow how they're doing, it's important that once the data, the data enters the hospital, that someone gets alerted. There needs to be a nurse practitioner or a physician or a trauma coordinator that hears, listen, there's data coming in from these homes, now you need to interpret it. So you need to establish internally how this data flows, who looks at it, who's responsible, and how it moves around the trauma system in your hospital. Another important aspect of this is the support. You need to have support for the home, the connectivity, as well as internal support. You need to have support so that the devices don't work in the patient's home, if the neck goes down, or your coordinator gets confused and they're not sure how this is going to work. It's critical that you have a way, like a 24-7 help desk for the IT. Another important supporting technology within the hospital is the data repository. Where does this data go? Is it a database? Is it a spreadsheet? How does this work? So when the nurse coordinator or whoever is alerted to the fact that data is coming in, where do you put it? And what's very important to realize here about the supporting technology is just do the math. If you have three devices in a patient's home and you have 100 trauma patients that you're following and you're capturing data every 10 minutes, the numbers are impressive. Think of the data points that will be coming in. Unless there's some way of prioritizing that data you may not be able to tell what is important and what is not important. VisiQ, which is one of the ICU telemedicine solutions, has a very savvy and very slick system for prioritizing data. What's more important, that a patient's wound is red or that the patient's hematocrit hasn't changed for the last week? And if a nurse has three hours of work to do looking at data, there needs to be a way of making the, some sort of a priority about this data. Lastly, within the hospital, it's important that you capture this data into the EMR. How do you transport this data into a permanent record? Not only for the patient's sake, if they come back later on for a clinic visit, but also for medical legal reasons. So what aspects of trauma are um, acceptable or are good for home care and telemedicine? Obviously, the main one would be an acute inpatient discharge to home. It's a way of creating a longitudinal following of that patient when they go home. If patients are discharged faster, if patients are remotely um, located, or if patients are less sure about some of the changes, when they go home, you can continue to follow them. Another interesting aspect of teletrauma and home care would be following a patient from rehabilitation to home. You could, you could potentially follow a patient when they go to rehab, and then when they go home, it's just the next step. You could follow them through a video teleconference, follow their labs as we've talked about, and also talk to them on a routine basis. I think one of the aspects of home care for trauma that hasn't been fully investigated would be how you can prepare a family in a remote location for patients discharged. If the patient lives 200 miles away, if it's in the winter, or if the patient is poor and can't afford to, the patient's family is poor and can't afford to drive, how do you successfully set the family up, the patient's future caregivers up, so that when the patient arrives home, they understand the change. And I think that using telemedicine and trauma home care is a great way to do this. You could talk to the family members, 
um, and key um, physicians in the community to get them ready for this patient coming back. This will decrease the risk of this patient having to be readmitted and also decrease the, decrease the risk of having complications. And another aspect of home care and trauma would be the ability to conduct research. Currently, there's a lot of protocols looking at the safety for early discharge, what medications may be effective, and ways to make the systems better. <clears throat> it's true that you could conduct research when the patient is home. You could follow their medications and all the things that I've said before, but it's a way of actually making our studies potentially more accurate and also more effective. So the trauma workflow model is very important. You set up your staff. The staff have to understand this and they have to buy into this. You need to educate your own staff who will be interacting with this, and I think no one knows this better than Dr. Latifi. You need to have the technology support desk, as I've talked about beforehand. So when the patient is discharged to home or discharged to rehabilitation, the information triage process starts. The nurse, the coordinator, the physician starts to capture the data, and as I said before, you need to have decision algorithms and rules processes. You need, it needs to be very clear for your staff and for the system what to do. If you can't reach the patient or the patient doesn't call in a specified period of time, you need to either call their house, get them into an emergency room, or get a visiting nurse out there. If a patient's having problems and you can't figure it out, it needs to be very clear to the staff what you do. Your options could be you talk to them tomorrow, or if there's any questions, send them to the ER. But these sort of algorithms are important, and also it's safe for the patients to make a telemedicine trauma home care solution work. And another interesting part of this is the follow-up and the communication. If you want to talk to patients, there's more than just getting data. How would you talk to them? If you've got a concern about the patient, do you call them on the phone, or do you think it'll be financially feasible in five years or so, two years, who knows, one year, just to do standard video teleconferencing in every patient's home? I think it'll be interesting to see how cheap of a solution for video teleconferencing we can obtain. I think it's optimal to use video teleconferencing if you can because you can see the patient and see their body language, which you can't do over the phone. There are special considerations about home care for trauma. Staff acceptance, as I've talked about before, don't discount the importance of this. A lot of folks feel that telemedicine is voodoo. It's new. It's different. You're not touching the patient directly. But it's no doubt this is right for the patients. As I've said before, having a help desk for 24-7 technology support can be difficult to integrate into a hospital. Here at UPMC, with some of the work that Dr. Wexler is doing in Telestroke, we're currently having to set up this health, health desk, and this is going to be challenging for us. I do believe that there are medical legal considerations. Um, we need to educate patients ahead of time. What is this going to do, and what are your expectations? And reimbursement. For operations within the United States, you have a 90-day global period for reimbursement, and the patient's care can be captured within this, and the physicians are, re are reimbursed in this period of flat rate. But what's going to happen if you see a patient but don't operate on them? How can you get reimbursed for this care? You may have to negotiate with a local insurance plan, and it may come to the point where patients have to pay out of pocket. And I know that sounds outrageous, but in the United States, the field of a boutique or personal home care is actually starting to explode as well. And I think in some situations, it's not unreasonable. We're also seeing tremendous corporate interest in the realm of home care. Devices, we need, we need the device library they talked about with the various, like the pill dispensers, which we've seen having a Band-Aid that can actually read your EKG as well as your pulse ox, um, having the ability to check someone's INR at home and send it back. Companies like Intel and other major companies are looking at this in the United States. Communications platforms are going to be critical. I think Bluetooth will take the lead in this realm, but it's very hard to predict. In terms of portability, I think the main companies will be BlackBerry and Apple. Um, Apple obviously has an incredible device, but it's less secure. Um, we actually at UPMC were meeting with the CEO of BlackBerry last week, and this is one of the lead areas for interest in them, I mean interest for them which is healthcare. And I also think that the federal government in the United States and our Federal Communications Corporation is putting hundreds of millions of dollars into networks across the United States. And I think one of the model networks that we've seen and one of the model ways to do this is in Arizona. So 
So imagine if you can follow your most severely injured trauma patients at home and at rehab. Imagine if you can ensure follow-up for remote patients. If you can ensure that medications and rehabilitation are successfully done at home. Imagine if your clinical trials would start as an inpatient, continue to rehab, or followed at home. We know that telemedicine is expanding inter internationally as well as exponentially. In countries like Brazil, United States, uh, interest in Colombia as well, I certainly know in the Middle East, we're seeing in England as well, this is real and it's coming and it's going to be very good for the patients. The technology will continue to evolve, to evolve. It's close, it's not there yet. And I also think it's important to recognize that leaders such as Dr. Latifi are critical for this to be successful and we need to support them. And I'm very happy that Dr. Puyana and also Dr. Peitzman are down there because I think that they're gonna have a supportive role in this as, as well. And I also welcome their help here in Pittsburgh and also welcome their expertise. Um, thank you very much and I'll be happy to take any questions. Dr. Watson, that was superb, uh, superb. Thank you so much. Um, any questions from the audience? I have a question. Yes. Dr. Watson, I'm Antonio Martins. I'm, I'm from Brazil. I, I actually work in Miami at, at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Uh, two points. First, I, I was discussing uh, with the, my friends here from Brazil about the tele, uh, home, home health main, uh, mentoring or monitoring. And how, how is your vision about reimbursement for this? So in Brazil, we live in a country where the, the insurance company pay a, a, a very little money uh, for, 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 for patients, for the reimbursement is really bad. And how, how do you feel going to be like for the, the, the countries in developing like Brazil, like the South America? Uh, how can you convince the insurance companies to, to put money to, to, pre, to do prevention and to avoid like patients go to the hospital? What's your vision about this? Oh, you brought up the dirty question. Yeah, right. The <laughs> <laughs> uh, whole idea. <laughs> uh, you, you, <laughs> you, you hit the nail on the head, absolutely. Um, I think one of the hardest parts about telemedicine is the fact that the insurance companies and the payers are only looking at this from the value of why do I have to pay money up front, which is short-sighted and it's wrong. We need longitudinal studies to show them that, and that's why I brought up the congestive heart failure model. If you implement this, you save money. It's silly. It's like, why do you educate your children? Well, it costs so much to educate them. Why would I educate them? It makes no sense. So I think right now, especially with the financial hardship that we're seeing, that people are balking at relatively limited upfront costs, but the downstream savings are important. So everything that we can do to get grants to study this in its infancy will support our cases later on. You know, UPMC is unique in that we have a, uh, we're a bound system. We have an integrated payer within UPMC. So we have our own insurance plan, and we're working with them to start paying for various aspects of telemedicine. And we believe that showing outcomes will be very important to show others around the world, and hopefully in our country, that yes, you should pay for it. Now, we went down recently to the Center for Medicaid and Medicare in Baltimore, um, and they're the main payers, Medicaid obviously in the United States, um, they're it. I should say that's the most lavish building I've ever been in, which made me very depressed, and I know where my tax dollars are going. Um, but they're, you know, they're reluctant to pay for this as well. I think the other way to show folks is going to be to make these devices cheap and we've got to put pressures on companies to make them cheap, if not disposable, but cheap. Great question. Great, uh, thank you very much. I think um, the, the, the future absolutely is there. No one wants to stay in the hospital. Even us trauma surgeons don't want to live in there anymore. If I can do it from home, it would be great. <laughs> and uh, it, certainly, if we can get patients out of the hospital, it's, uh, it's much better. As you know, most of the MRSA and other infections are actually going from patient to patient while they're in the hospital. So treating them at home makes so much sense. And I congratulate you on, on a beautiful presentation and a great program that you have at, at your hospital. And thanks for very kind words uh, toward us. I uh, suggest that we go on to the next talk, if you have it there. Uh, if you're not tired or if you, you need, okay, great. Uh, and uh, 
the next talk is really, really important. And, and what are we talking is the telementoring and how can we really teach people uh, from from any uh, any distance. So uh, when I was looking around the country, I couldn't find anyone better to do than Dr. Watson. So Dr. Watson, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say what a, a real honor it is again to be talking to this group and um, and and talking to you folks in Brazil. Um, I have tremendous respect for what is being done down there and, um, and the nature of this conference. And I respect the fact that you folks are here because telemedicine, in my view, really is going to be the future of healthcare. Um, I had an interesting experience last week that I wanted to relate that UPMC is a $7 billion hospital system. It's one of the largest in the countries. And our Center for Telemedicine has been going for about 14 months now to 16 months. And it's been a struggle, not going to lie to you, for the reasons that the gentleman asked earlier with how to get it paid for. Um, but we actually spoke to the UPMC board, two of us did, for the first time um, in front of the full board of the corporation, and we had widespread acceptance, which I thought, finally, for our system, is going to be a great step forward. But it's interactions with colleagues such as yourself and um, learning from the experts, like Dr. Latifi, this is how we're going to make this work. And I think it's really important that we support each other in this and if you ever have a question, feel free to call me. Um, obviously, we've got teleconferencing up here. I'd love to talk to you. Telementoring and surgery, I believe, um, is in going to be in the future. I think we're about two to three years off from full-blown telementoring and surgery. Telementoring itself is what is this? It's the way of mentoring other surgeons remotely. It's using real-time data and two-way audio-video communication to help a surgeon do something. It could be in the clinic, it could be at home, it could be in the field, it could be remotely, it could be in another country, and it could also be, very importantly, in the operating room. We found a real need for this here in Pittsburgh, and we're starting to explore this. An example of this would be, and I know that we've all had this, if there's a motor vehicle accident 100 miles away, it's the winter, there's a storm, and the transport is grounded. The helicopters can't fly um, because of the weather. To drive the patient would be two hours by ground. The patients have the GCS of eight, they're hypotensive, they're being transfused, and you get a phone call. A lot of what we do right now is based by phone calls or with inadequate decision-making data. What do you do with this patient? How do you help this patient remotely? And we've all been there, and this is a real problem. And this is a very, this is one of many examples of why telementoring and trauma, but also in surgery, has real merit. In the United States right now, we're having problems with, with physician recruitment and retention. Um, CNN, which is our main news source here, for better or for worse, I shall say, had a, the front page of CNN yesterday said that one half of United States physicians said they would quit, which is incredible. Front page of CNN. And then, a subset of that comment is physician recruitment and retention. At tertiary centers where you have a large group of, of physicians, that's fine. You have got an academic community, you've got peers. But I was talking to a surgeon last week who lives 100 miles from where I am. He's the only general surgeon in this town. He takes call every night. Every time he has to go away, they have to hire a locum tenens or a temporary physician. This person has no backup, no peers, and no one to run cases by. So we actually are gonna start a telementoring system with him and a tele-second opinion system for him. But for these small hospitals, it's very hard to recruit physicians. Another good example is there's a hospital north of Pittsburgh where they have a new urologist and an old urologist. And the old urologist decided he did not like the new guy. So what did he do? He ignored him. Then what happens? The new, the new physician starts having complications, take backs, it goes on his record, he gets sued, and then he leaves. Why would he stay there? So a way of telemetry and reaching out to physicians, experienced physicians, second opinions, or guiding other physicians remotely is critical. It's critical that we do this and do this well. This process is not established in surgery yet. It's a theoretical. It's not widely accepted, nor is it published. And quite frankly, nor is it supported right now. But look what some of our peers are doing. Look what's going on in other industries. Look at the maritime industry, for example. What happens when a large freighter comes into port? 
Who do they get? They get a pilot. You stop the boat, you put somebody else on board who's an expert in the local waters, and they guide that ship into port. Look at the airline industry. They've got a co-pilot flying with you every time. Look at the legal industry. If you've got a complicated case, what do you do? You bring in a team of legal experts. What do we do in the United States? A surgeon operates alone right now. Sometimes you'll have a second surgeon in the room, but if you're operating at night, or if you have a major complication that requires a specialist, are they gonna be there for you? Maybe not. You may have to let that patient sit on the table for 20 minutes waiting for somebody to come in. You may not even have that specialist at the hospital. So the implications of this are tremendous. We need assistance with the complicated, challenging, or potentially life-threatening situations. And this is why telemetry and surgery trauma is critical. And why don't surgeons do this? I don't know. The field of surgery is being challenged. Um, <clears throat> I worked for the American Board of Surgery about 20% of my time. In fact, I was at the board um, last Monday and going to them next Monday. Um, general surgery training and surgery um, on the national level is, is very, very challenged right now. In the United States, residents can work 80 hours. The Institute of Medicine currently in the United States is looking at a 50-hour model. We've been talking to Mr. William Smith, who's one of the lead surgical educators in the United Kingdom. They're going to 48 hours. I am supportive, and I'll say that again, supportive of work hour restrictions, but there's no doubt that this limits training. It does, it limits the experiential training. I think as a result of this, that when residents come out of training or fellowship, there's gonna be a period of time that they need to transition to a full-blown attending. It's like cutting the umbilical cord kind of slowly. Right now, when you're done with training, they throw you off the deep end and say, go at it. But I'm not sure that's the right way to do it. Also, in this field of surgery, we've got increased specialization. If you look at the subsets now of vascular surgery, if you look at um, surgical oncology with breast surgery, with endocrine surgery, with thoracic surgery, I mean, these used to be combined to some degree with a general surgeon. Um, my <clears throat> great-grandfather and um, was a he was a surgeon here in Pittsburgh and did everything. Uh, my great uncle and grandfather are both surgeons. Uh, my great uncle, um, William Watson, did neurosurgery, gynoc surgery, as well as general surgery. Uh, my father was a, was a surgeon and he was duly trained in thoracic in general. What am I trained in? I'm trained in colorectal surgery and minimally invasive surgery. That's all that I do. We're seeing specialization, which means that you're gonna have less comfort outside your area, which means you're less able to deal with other problems. You're going to need more help. And as I said earlier, we're having tremendous shortages appear in rural and underserved areas. <clears throat> Physician recruitment is a real challenge in surgery. And as I said before, we need to look at this now before it's too late. There are also legal implications of our mistakes. If we start making a lot of errors, as I said in my last talk, it's gonna be held against you. There are gonna be websites saying, well, boy, you know, Watson has two times as many complications as Latifi. You know, Latifi's probably better than him and they're gonna go and see Rafat rather than myself. Public awareness of how we do is gonna be important. If you can use telementoring to decrease your complications, decrease your length of stay, and also increase your success rate overall of how you treat your patients, use it, it's worth it. We're also seeing an interesting problem with emergency departments. For example, every emergency department in the United States has to have stroke coverage. But how often do you get a stroke? So you have to pay $3,000 a night as the hospital does to have a neurologist be on call for stroke. But if you can use telemedicine, telementoring, you can actually have folks on call, but they're remote. It's cheaper for the hospitals and probably better for the patients. So why do telementoring and trauma? And this I think is very obvious. The acuity of decision-making and the ramifications <clears throat> of decision-making are very, very clear. It has been widely established um, that ATLS is the way to drive trauma and how these traumas are, are um, managed. You have a rapid progression of decision making and the ATLS you have to be certified to do this and as well as to teach this. But the upfront, if you make a mistake in the first 10 minutes, it could have tremendous, if not fatal, downstream ramifications for the patients. So trauma of all the fields is one of the, the most important fields for telemetering in my mind. 
because also you may be dealing with complex urological injuries. You may be dealing with <clears throat> cardiac injuries. You may have vascular injuries where you can rely upon subspecialists to some degree, maybe to run something by them, to say that I'm here in the OR, I have this patient you know, who's, who's lost one of the, who's lost the iliac artery, the other one's in trouble, how can I repair this? What is your experience? Versus saying, well, in my opinion, the best may be there's ways that we can do things and rely upon our specialists. Traumas are not all concentrated in one area. They're random and they're just geographically dispersed. So it's hard to have all your specialists mobilized in all over the place. And therefore, if you had telementoring available, your specialist could go to any hospital, anywhere, anytime. The transfer of the trauma, the time of highest risk, it's the worst possible thing currently to do. If you can avoid the transfer of trauma through telementoring, if you can guide someone at the remote hospital and take them through ATLS, help with decision support, give them advice, it may actually stabilize the patient remotely, if not allow the patient to stay at the hospital, at the very least, it may make the transfer less, the transfer less risky. And the expense of transfer should not be um, discounted. The expense of flying people in helicopters um, is tremendous. And also, when the patient leaves the local hospital, that hospital loses the billing of the labs, the hospital loses the billing of radiology, the, the pro fees, um, the physician fees. So there's, real, uh, there's a real economic model behind why telementoring is needed for local hospitals to support them. And also with trauma, one of the main reasons is just the complexity of decision making that occurs with a multi-system trauma. And it can be very hard for people that may not have seen this before where you're outside of your comfort zone, how do you help them? As I said before, an avoidable adverse outcome in a trauma bay or an operating room can lead to a higher cost of the care, an increased, increased length of stay, medical legal exposure that you just don't want, and post-surgical complications. The patients suffer, the physicians suffer, and the hospitals suffer. We all suffer together. And this is why telemetry can have a real role. And as I said before, how much will physician ratings be a factor when the public looks at this? boy, who's my surgeon, how good are they? What examples do we have of telementoring? Urology has some literature on this, which is somewhat vague from what I can tell, but they have looked at this using video teleconferencing. In neurosurgery here at UPMC, we've got a specialist, Dr. Min Kassam. He does endonasal surgery. Um, you, he's currently one of the leaders in the world. In fact, he is the leader in the world um, in this field. <clears throat> he uses the nose as an access port to the brain. In the past, where he did a craniectomy or a craniotomy, or he, did a, or he took half the face off to gain access to the base of the brain. He goes through the, the nose and gains access to the, um, the base of the brain. He invented this. He's the main person in the world for this. He'll run five or six or seven ORs in a day simultaneously in our system but how it's, he's the rate limiting step for this procedure. He shows patients that would have had half their face taken off and three cranial nerves divided to gain access to the tumor who had a 10% um, morbidity and a 1% mortality. He's showing these patients out in the park the next day walking their dog. It's been on the Discovery Channel and on news. He's had a tenfold reduction in the mortality and morbidity. It's incredible. But how does this gentleman, how does this physician spread the wealth? How does he mentor other people and teach them? He had to define the anatomy, the terms, and the instrumentation to do this. It doesn't make sense for other people to do this. So at UPMC, we're looking at a telementoring network right now. We've been doing this for six months. Um, this is a part of a joint venture with Alcatel Lucent, who's a major telecommunications provider, UPMC, as well as GE. Um, it's a several million dollar proof of concepts being developed that we're working with laparoscopic vendors as well to create a network, which I'll show you later on. Remote robotic surgery is another example of telementoring. If you think about it, in some of the Midwest states in the United States, you can have a robot be in the OR and the surgeon be several hundred miles away. You can take a local surgeon through a case using the robot and gradually train them how to do the surgery. With time, when that local surgeon has seen five, 10, 15 cases, you can actually have them start doing part of the case, set the robot up to be the assistant, not the surgeon, and gradually wean the robot out of the case 
where eventually you're just watching the video of the surgery, not participating at all. And this is an example of telementoring. We have laparoscopic rooms in the United States. Stores, Stryker, Olympus are trying to do this too. They have created rooms where three or four OR suites can be, can be linked together. Um, UCLA now has a massive Stryker installation, I'm sorry, stores installation. Um, we have a very large Stryker installation and a very large stores installation. But don't, <clears throat> don't think this is a telementoring solution. And I will warn everybody, these are limited, very limited um, function, functioning rooms. These ORs are linked to hard wiring. They are wired directly using coax cable, fiber termination. These are not on your network. They have some functionality in terms of video telecommunications, but they are very, very limited. And they have some telementoring and some telestration, but it's difficult. The telestration can be one way, and I'll get back to this in a second. But we've seen some of this, is what I want to say in surgery, but this is not a great solution. And I'll, I'll warn everybody, if you buy a laparoscopic OR suite, watch out for the expense. It sounds great up front, but once the honeymoon's over, it's a lot of work and it's very, very expensive. So what technologies support telementoring and teletrauma, for example, in the trauma bay, the operating room, or the clinic? If you look in the upper right-hand corner, this is a picture of a device in the teletrauma system in Maine. This is actually a, a pan, tilt, zoom camera and telecommunications device that's in the trauma bay. <clears throat> it sits out of the way, it doesn't interfere with the physicians, and also allows the x-rays to be taken. In the lower right-hand corner is the same device I showed earlier, um, which is the suitcase with the cameras and the rest of the devices. I think another way to do telementoring in the OR would be cameras in the overhead lights, cameras that are built into the operating rooms or placed on booms that can watch the surgeries. Therefore, the telementoring surgeon at a remote location can look at this and help to guide the surgery and provide advice. I showed a picture of a head camera there. I think the head cameras are a poor solution. Every time you move your head, the camera swings around. I think it's very hard to make these work, but in a pinch, yes, they could work. Telestration, this is critical. This is also complex. Telestration is if you're watching the video of another surgeon, Let's just say that you're in your OR performing a laparoscopic cholecystectomy, but on the screen beside you is a laparoscopic colectomy going on in a hospital 100 miles away. How do you show that surgeon to watch out the ureters right there? How do you say you're in the wrong plane? It's very hard for us to describe in words what you want someone to do. How do you say you're two cell layers off? If you look over there, you'll see the retroperitoneum. In there's the ureter. There's a pedicle here. Watch out for that and why don't you log into that perforator with ligature? How do you tell them that? And the answer is telestration. You should be able to reach over and touch the screen with your finger and draw lines and make X's and O's. Our uh, American football, they do a lot of this for sports. <clears throat> the moderators use telestration to show how plays unfold. This is critical. Telestration must be instantaneous. When you draw on the screen, it has to show up on the remote screen immediately. If someone's about to cut a ureter or someone's about to divide the critical pedicle, which will make the anastomosis ischemic, you have to tell them right away, don't do it. You have to say, stop and draw the line. So there's a two second delay, it may be too late. And another key part of this is low bandwidth. Tele telestration cannot take up a large amount of bandwidth. It must be easy to use <clears throat> and it must be easy for the physicians to reach over and say, hey, I'm just gonna show them right here, and right here and right now, don't do this or this is where you go. Telestration is critical for telementoring, especially in the OR. The other thing about the, other thing about, um, the field of uh, tele telementoring is going to be the whole facet of uh, internet connectivity. Um, I put a picture up of Dr. Latifi's, of Dr. Latifi's telemedicine backbone here. This is extremely impressive what they've done in Arizona. The diagram may be hard to see, but if you look at it, look at the large blue lines in the middle of that, um, of that rectangle. That rectangle is the state of Arizona. If you look at the blue lines that goes obliquely from the lower right to the middle of that big um, hub with the spokes, then goes up to the right, 
that is the, one of the key features of the network. That's a group of, of T3s. Those black lines, which are the spokes coming off those large blue lines, the T3s, are the T1s. So the, the, the University of Arizona with Dr. Latifi and Ron Weinstein have done an, an excellent job of creating a robust internet infrastructure. This is critical for telementoring. At UPMC, what we're working with is with, is with Alcatel Lucent. We've created a 10 gigabit backbone within our hospital. The larger your backbone is, the larger your connectivity, the more audio and visual and telestration data you can push across um, the network without any problems um, whatsoever. Video transport takes a large amount of bandwidth. Don't discount how much bandwidth this takes. <coughs> the quality of service is a big part of internet connectivity. The quality of service is a term that we should all be familiar with and what it is is if data is flowing through the internet and two pieces of data conflict, who has higher priority? Who has the higher quality of service? And why does that matter? Well, if you think about it, if, you're, if somebody in your office is surfing CNN and we're doing this teleconference right now, if that CNN web page conflicts with this video teleconference, this teleconference will start to become jittery, you could lose the call, or it could become pixelated. So having quality of service is critical. And as I said before, Having firewall access is very important for this to work. Having a wide area network like they've done at the University of Arizona is critical, and also making sure that this data is very, very secure, especially in the United States, um, is, is absolutely imperative as well. So for telementoring, what are the outcomes that, are that you look for? So if you're trying to establish a telementoring connection, you look for the jitter. Does the, screen, does the screen shake? Does the teleconference freeze for a second? Another outcome would be how much pixelation, those little squares that appear all over the screen. What is the ease of the connection? How easy, if you want to tell a mentor, let's just say that I'm in the operating room and I have a problem and I call Dr. Latifi at home, how easy is it for him to get on his home computer and connect to the operating room? And also, what happens if you lose the connection? What do you do? I've saved the best for last here, latency. When you think about it, look at yourself on the screen. When you wave your arms on the screen, look at the delay and how it appears remotely. And I don't know if you have the ability to do that, but what's the latency in transmission? When I talk to you, how much is the delay before you folks hear it there in Brazil? When you think about telementoring, what is the latency? If someone's about to commit a critical error that would adversely affect the patient and the outcome of surgery, what is the longest latency that is acceptable? So when I yell stop, or I use telestration to draw a huge line across the screen, how fast does it, how long does it take for them to see it? And this is a number that we need to study very carefully. There's been some theoretical numbers thrown out there, 250 milliseconds, that's a quarter of a second. Um, we believe that the number could be much larger than that. There's some thought that a very experienced surgeon thinks that latency could be as high as one second, maybe even two seconds. I don't think we know the answer for this, but for telementoring, we need to look at what is that number and to study this very, very carefully. So data is sent to the mentor real time. If somebody's watching you or helping you, they need to have real time data for decision making. If you're in the trauma bay and somebody 100 miles away is helping you do a trauma, they need to be able to get the same data that you see. You can have the medical device library we talked about in the last lecture with the various devices that will gather information about the patients. You can gather the vital signs, you can have a stethoscope, and you can see the patient. What other data should be fed to the remote surgeon? A CT scan, the FAST, and your radiology server, they should have access to all of that remotely. They should be able to see your electronic medical record. They should be able to see your medications. They should be able to see all the labs. All of this data is critical for real-time decision support. When you think about it, if you can't see all of this data, or at least a good part of it, it's not much better than making a phone call. One of the features of telemedicine is to create a network that will support this. So that, so that if somebody calls from a remote hospital, you can see the patient, see the physician, and at least see vital signs in the radiology. 
And this is not as hard as you think. And we've been doing this with Dr. Wexler, the Telestruck Network, um, here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So here's an example of how this might work. If you have a gunshot wound in a rural hospital and the patient's unstable, they're transported to the local hospital. The local hospital hears, heads up, here comes somebody, and they're sick. What you can do before the patient even arrives is to call your mentoring surgeon, and he might be 100 miles away, and to call him and say, we have a bad trauma coming in. I'm not sure I can handle this. Are you available to help me? <clears throat> if they say yes, you establish the communication up front before the patient ever arrives. So the patient arrives to the trauma bay, and in this way, the surgeon on site is ready and the mentoring surgeon on the remote site is ready. You have, um, you start watching their vital signs, you look at the x-rays, and you communicate with the local surgeon, guiding resuscitation, and take the local surgeon through the ATLS protocol. So in theory, somebody who's actually touching the patient may not be ATLS certified, but somebody mentoring them remotely is. So the patient is getting full ATLS quality care. The patient then goes to the operating room. So quickly you switch the telementoring scenario up to the operating room. You turn on the in-light cameras, you put the teleconferencing um, in the ORs and one of the screens, and the patient arrives. You have the live teleconferencing going, and the remote surgeon can see the lights, I mean, they can see the wound, they can see the process, and they can guide the surgeon through the damage control operations. The patient goes back to the ICU, you communicate to the ICU, finish the resuscitation, and then when the patient is stabilized by a team of expert surgeons, the team, then they can be transferred to the tertiary hospital if they need to be transferred at all. This model has not existed before, but when you think about the power of it, it's incredible. And I also think a lot of you are thinking about the expense of this, and yes, I recognize that. It's like nothing else though. Who would have thought we'd have cell phones in our hands all over the world? Who would have thought we'd have telementric and surgeon to surgery to this degree five years ago. Look at, the, um, look at what we're learning. I should also, if you're thinking about who's gonna pay for this and how, this is, how is this going to be done, 10 years ago in the United States, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy was considered to be heresy. It was considered to be witchcraft, it was wrong. Now it's the standard of care. It is the gold standard. So if you look at these technologies and hear these examples, don't discount them. They could be coming to us as well. As I've said before, I'm very supportive of the laparoscopic vendors, stores, strikers, who we work with here. Uh, we work with one of these companies closely, but be careful. These are closed OR solutions. These are not scalable for telementoring, and they're not integrated for telementoring. These are not easily integrated into your hospital system. These are extremely expensive to maintain because every time you have to change something, you call them and they start billing you by the hour. There's no one internally that can manage these. And beyond the operating rooms, there, there's very little integration to the office, and there's no integration to mobility, there's no integration to the home, a limited feature set. So yes, there's a form of interoperative telementoring here, but it's limited, expensive, and not scalable. It's not adequate for what we need, and I do not believe that we should rely upon these people to do that. These laparoscopic vendors make lenses. They are not experts in telecommunication. I respect them tremendously, I work with them, I appreciate their efforts, but we need to turn to the experts who have core competencies in this domain. This is an example of our network, and this is a complicated diagram, but it's this, this very simple here. Look at the red arrow in the middle of the screen, the one that's pointing from the lower left to the upper right. That's the hub of a laparoscopic operating room. All of these devices feed into it. At the top is an endoscopic camera, we've got a wall camera, we've got a microscope. What's very interesting though, is off to the left is our PAC system and the brain navigation for neurosurgery. You have to basically plug these into an auxiliary jack into the side of this thing. These are not integrated. The CT scan is very, the CT scan is actually integrated through another laparoscopic vendor. The neurophysiology, the donut in the right lower, right lower corner, that's not integrated. Look at the other red area, arrow off to the right. That's our network. This device has to go through another circular device in the middle through a triangle off to the second red arrow. That middle triangle costs us 
It's not connected. It has never been used. This multi-million dollar, six room, laparoscopic system is not connected to our network. It never has been, and the hospital doesn't want it. So if you think this is right for telementoring, it's not. It's expensive, it's cumbersome. At UPMC, we're looking at a new model for telementoring. We're changing the model. What you see with the orange boxes in the middle is with what we're working with all telelucence. This is a gateway. This is an open platform highway for information. It can handle the radiology. It can handle the microscopes. It can handle the labs. It can handle the vital signs. It can handle the CT scanners. It can handle the, the laparoscopic vendors' rooms. All of this will be plugged into the network. And what it means is that this central orange highway of information will communicate with the two triangles to the right. One is at home, one is the office. This is two-way audiovisual communication. It's the data. It's the telestration, as I said, is critical. It's all that you need for real-time, immediate decision support. So as I wrap this up, the benefits of telementoring are very, very important. It can affect the length of stay. If you have a shorter OR and less complications, there's no doubt that that's going to be better for the patients. It can affect the quality and the cost of health care, which they said is driving us right now in the U.S. It can, it can help the comfort of rural physicians in stabilizing and managing complex care, especially with trauma patients or complex interoperative decision making. Patients prefer to stay at the local hospital and this way we can enable them to stay at the local hospital. As I said before, the cost of transferring these patients is extremely high. And in an era where healthcare costs are spiraling and our economy is not doing so well, this is relevant. And if you say that I was doing an operation and I had three specialists help me, with, or I consulted with two other physicians, it may help the medical legal exposure of complications after surgery. There's a real benefit to the local hospital financially to keep these patients there, as I've mentioned before. So the implications of telemedicine, this is right for the patients and it's right for the doctors. It can augment and also bridge education and training of surgeons. You can, you can get reliable help when you need it without wait. As I've said before, in terms of physician recruitment and physician retention, this is going to be a, play a real role in how we help these other small hospitals get the staff they need. Yes, there's an upfront investment, but this has a real benefit for the enterprise. Thank you for letting me speak. I love these topics. Call me, email me anytime, and I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful review uh, of the great potential that we really have. I wanted to uh, just... Uh, um, mostly for the audience, but I would like to, to have your comments on that. Uh, your university has been known for uh, uh, telementoring now in the field of bariatric surgery for a long time. Uh, and I guess uh, it has been really moved to different parts of the world, uh, especially different parts of the United States, where people come in, take those courses, uh, where uh, I, then Dr. F uh, Phil Schauer and others would do a bariatric surgery and a room full of surgeons would follow step by step uh, on a big screen. And then after that, we did this in uh, Richmond, Virginia, and some other parts of the world. Uh, I believe that uh, we in trauma surgery, it's somewhat difficult to mimic uh, the big disaster we get, an injury to the vena cava and so on. But I think we should be more creative and use that kind of approach to really educate uh, uh, folks around the world. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I actually, uh, I was one of Phil Shower's fellows in 2001. I know Phil very well. Um, and yes, he would be running at one point three rooms and have one room going off site. And he'd have two or three mini fellows in the room. So for the model of training, what we realized with the mini fellowships is that, as you know, in trauma or as a surgeon, you can set up your assistant to succeed. When these mini fellows would do a couple cases, thought it was pretty easy, they'd go to their other institution and then all of a sudden lose their assistance and get into trouble. So I think that telementoring is a way of taking these mini fellowships and when they go back to their home institution, supporting them and enabling them to succeed. For trauma, I think there's, I, think I agree with you 100%. As I said, the training's gonna be more limited and that we need to find a way to help mentor people. 
One thing you could do is to have a series of video libraries that you could review with these folks to help teach them. Um, but I think if you had a mini fellowship and went to places such as Columbia or in Colony and Columbia or areas that have high densities of trauma to teach them there, then when they, when they went back to their home institution, you could have surgeons standing by helping to guide them when they go back. So I, I like what you're saying. There has to be some hands-on real life experience, but they also, when they go back to their home hospital, there needs to be support to help that training. Training and education does not work with a quick blast of exposure and no reinforcement. Training is done through reinforcement of what you learn, and that can be done through telemetry. <clears throat> Great, I, I could not agree more with that. Any uh, questions? Uh, Dr. Martins, uh, again, he is from, uh, he's a Brazilian from Miami. Let's see what he has to say. So I believe that you are very fortunate that uh, Latif and Clinal, they create this course because we can really talk and share something that you are doing telemedicine. I have a, a couple of points to you. First, I believe that this, this, this uh, I did a research in Miami and 30% of the patients that receive in the trauma center uh, really did not need to come to the trauma center. There is more injuries that could be managed in the, in the remote hostels. Imagine sometimes I receive a patient from QS, which, which is more burn, and then the patient goes to the hostel. It's a, a lot of cost to be transferred by helicopter, and the families are four or five hours away from the hostel. So this is really hu huge. I really believe this kind of system is uh, going to help a lot to, to manage this kind of patients. And also, uh, sometimes I receive patients that are not correctly managed, so sometimes having a surgeon from the trauma center for a major hostel helping the, our, our colleagues in a remote hostel is really very important. So really would, uh, should stimulate other places to do this uh, in other states also. <coughs> I have some questions. What about OR cameras? We are trying to, to, to use the OR cameras and have a lot of problems with the glare. Are you using these in, in, the, in the, the lights? How, how are you managing these? I tested like high definition cameras, but this is still an issue. Are you using these? Are you testing these a lot or not? What's your experience with that? One of the things that I find that works very well, um, I actually got this from Ron Merrill, who I think is down there, um, who's part of this. And Dr. Merrill had the idea, and it just struck me. Of, um, <clears throat> you can use a laparoscopic camera to film surgeries. So if you take a Metaflex liver retractor, clamp it to the table, use a 10 degree scope and 30 degrees, and just point it into the wound. So in open surgery, you have the laparoscopic camera hanging over the wound. It is the single best way to get video out of the OR. A, because the overhead camera, every time you lean inside it, you'll see my ball, my ball spot or my hair, which isn't very good. Secondly, the, the angle of an overhead camera is not what we see. So it's unusual. If you're trying to help some, someone through surgery, it's a different perspective. The other option is to use head cameras, which is like being on the high seas. You know, get sick, you'll have to wear a scopolamine patch for the, for the nausea. But the best way to do this is with a laparoscopic camera. I think the over-the-shoulder cameras, you have to have at least two for that, but again, it's an abnormal perspective. The best way is with a Metaflex or fast clamp liver retractor, a 1030 scope, and then you can use, I don't, I don't, I think high definition right now isn't necessary, by the way. You don't have to use it. Use standard definition, it's fine. But you don't have the, how to remote control the camera. You need somebody just to point to whatever you want, right? Well, oh, but you can get a very broad field of view. Okay. I think in the future, what Polycom is looking at right now is a device you can hang into the wound, like have a reticulating arm, and it can have a pan, tilt, and zoom camera on there. I was at the University of Pennsylvania. I was there with the Board of Surgery, and the University of Pennsylvania has installed booms, and each boom has a camera on it which can be controlled remotely. So yes, we're getting there. You can hang the camera into the wound and then drive it. Okay, one last question. Uh, how is the addition of your faculty, or your, our colleagues in telemedicine, for example, besides the crazy guys like us that like to do that, that are always pushing to do telemedicine, for example, in Miami, you are 15 attendings in, in tra doing trauma and critical care. Uh, we do trauma in the ICU every day. They like to have, like, the in the trauma ICU, they, they like to have the, the, the telemedicine at the bedside, the standard of care. But when I tell them, okay, uh, you can, like, manage a patient from home or you can, or can like, see a patient in the ICU from home, uh, most of them told me, oh, why are you giving me more, more trouble, more, more work? When I'm home, I want to be home. 
So how is the adhesion uh, in Pittsburgh, how is it in, in Tucson about doing telemedicine? Are everybody excited like us or how do you feel about that? <laughs> Not many people are very excited like we are, but uh, I'll tell you how we uh, have decided to do in Tucson and maybe it will help you. We decided that uh, uh, the attending of, for ICU attending, uh, nowadays we make telephone rounds in the evening. You know, call the, you call the resident and you kind of do chart to review what's on with Mrs. Jones and uh, Mrs. Rodriguez and so on. So now we're going to have that telemedicine unit and we're going to see patients. It was a little bit grumping uh, from the attending, oh, you know, but I think it's going to work. I think it's going to work and uh, hopefully next year I can tell you the result what we have done this year. But uh, it is important that we really push this. Uh, on the camera, I just want to allude what uh, uh, Andy said. I was with Dr. Merrill at that time when we did this. Uh, uh, we would do mostly for, mostly for thyroids and dedicated really operations when, when there's not a lot of blood and the moves are not aggressive. You know, you move very gently with those thyroid glands. And it was really very nice. Uh, you could see any operations, any part. We did a hernia operations actually in uh, Ecuador. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I was his... He was his own control because he would ask me, what is the structure? And if I said, well, that's inguinal nerve uh, without being, he would know that I was wrong. So we were 100% correct on all the anatomy question that he asked us from Ecuador in a, in a very slow bandwidth. Uh, but again, using that uh, camera, uh, laparoscopic camera on the open moon. So it really, really worked very well for, for telemetry. Excellent. Uh, we, uh, oh, one quick thing that we, um, when I went down to, I went down to Cali, Colombia with the Board of Surgery, Dr. Puyano, and we started filming traumas in Colombia. In fact, I think we're going to go down in January, Arafat. Oh, good. <laughs> so we set, we set up one of the surgeons with a laparoscopic camera, and he'd never done this before. He'd never filmed with a laparoscopic camera. And he sent us back in two weeks six DVDs of incredible footage of open surgery for trauma that we've never seen before. The vantage point was perfect. It's like you were the surgeon. It's incredible. And the other point about getting staff buy-in, the best way to get your staff to buy into this whole process of telemedicine is focus on their pain. What's their pain? Try to figure it out. Each one's going to have a different take on this. Try to talk to them, figure out what they need out of it, and go after that. You're not going to get everybody, but try to find the highest value players and focus on their pain and make it work. I appreciate that. That's, that was a really great uh, conclusion. Uh, the Columbia, okay, uh, Dr. Kleina de Costa is a professor of surgery in Manaus. Uh, he has a question. Thank you. And professor uh, Watson. Watson. Uh, I had a question. Uh, what, what kind of the equipments and the software if the you use it when you discharge the patient go home to follow up in the home. Did you hear Did that, you Andy? Repeat the question, please. Yeah, he said, what kind of questions and what kind of equipment you, what kind of equipment and software you using uh, when you send patients home? That was a question from Dr. Uh, Costa. It's all experimental right now. There's, there is no very good package of hardware or software to do this. It's all experimental. These are small trials with devices that were created by companies right now. There is no standard. I think that we're probably one to two years away from seeing this across the board. What they have been using right now are using visiting nurses that carry portable devices with them that have blood pressure cuffs, stethoscopes, and other devices. But in terms of a completely independent system with the data feed coming back, we don't have that. One thing we have done at UPMC is started a teledermatology application which solved the workflow issue that I mentioned. It actually accepts the pictures, routes them, the physician can interpret them and push them back. But this was created and written at UPMC, so there's nothing that's commercially available yet. I think we're about one to two years away from that. Okay. I, uh, I need this question because uh, I see a, a presentation of Intel Intel uh, about the, the multi-parametric systems to follow up patients. And the, 
I need to to talk with you and the, us about the cost of this. Okay, I, I think we can follow up on that, Andy. It's, it, it was uh, uh, if we can have the uh, Intel equipment or some other equipment on this. I can tell you that one company that we work with, uh, and a very small company in Washington, uh, has created these units. They call them Turtle, and it's a very small. Uh, I think so. Far, right now, it's still too expensive, and you can integrate everything: the blood pressure, the glucose, and it's very mobile. It's small. You can give it to the patient. Once they are finished, you bring them back and you reuse them for next patient. So uh, we we can we can discuss these technologies uh, in great details. All right. Happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. I have to tell you the weather here is probably better than in Pittsburgh. <laughs> It's snowing here. <laughs> it's snowing. Ooh, we don't like snow here. Does it ever snow here in Campinas? No. No, no snow. Andy, thank you so Remember, much. Snow, snow equals trauma. I, I understand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, great lectures. I really appreciate your your hanging with us for the last uh, hour and a half. And um, appreciate it again. Uh, good to see you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. The next uh, uh, speaker is uh, uh, not here, but he will be. He sent me a video, sent us a video. Uh, this is uh, Colonel uh, Ronald Poropatich. Uh, he was a former president of uh, American Telemedicine Association, and uh, he's one of the really key leaders in the world uh, on telemedicine. He's now in charge of the Army uh, telemedicine projects all over the United States but the army that is all over the world uh, and so on. Uh, you'll, you'll like uh, what he has to say, uh, and hopefully in the next couple of minutes we'll be able to, to uh, listen to him. Uh, pretty, this is his entire presentation. Uh, <clears throat> he is Croatian by uh, nationality, and a lot of Croatians are in, in Brazil, I understand. Uh, so we should be able to, uh, he will talk in English, I think, but we'll see. Okay. Hello, I'm Colonel Ron Poropadich, Deputy Director for the Telemedicine and Advanced Technology Research Center at the U.S. Army Medical Research and Material Command here at Fort Detrick, Maryland. And it's my pleasure to spend the next 30 minutes talking to you about some of the telemedicine technologies that we're using both in the United States as well as for deployed forces throughout the world, primarily in Iraq and Afghanistan. What I'd like to do first, though, is thank Dr. Rifat Latifi, my good friend who uh, extended the invitation for me to speak to you today. I regret that I'm not able to be there in person and enjoy the beautiful country of Brazil and to make new friends among the conference participants, but I hope that this video conference message will suffice at least in explaining to you all some of the exciting technologies that we're using here in the United States Army throughout the world. Going to my first talk, uh, uh, my first slide rather, I'd like to just give a disclaimer that these views are the views uh, of myself and do not necessarily reflect those of the U.S. Army or the Department uh, of Defense. My topics are six for this meeting. I'm going to cover some teleconsultation capabilities for the United States Army both here in the, in the U.S. as well as for deployed forces, talk about how we're working with NATO in Afghanistan, and then some specific clinical areas in radiology, medical maintenance, surgical mentoring, and critical care medicine. This slide is a very busy slide, and I apologize, but it's meant to show you that there has been, over the last 15 years now, a rather extensive network of telemedicine capabilities in the United States Army and it's worldwide capable for a variety of specialties such as traumatic brain injury, dermatology, pathology, and radiology. Right now there's well over 100 servers located throughout the world and 16 in Southwest Asia where we're pushing x-ray images, CAT scans throughout for interpretation. Likewise, there are 31 sites for dermatology primarily in the United States as well as supporting overseas locations. And then the medical center ex expertise is localized uh, in uh, six key areas. In Germany, at Launchstuhl Regional Medical Center, the large army hospital there, 
Brook Army Medical Center is doing almost 400 dermatology consults a month, 300 cardiac echoes a month. And there in Hawaii, as you see, pediatric consults are averaging about 60 consults a month with electronic ICU going from Guam Naval. The busiest sites is uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center in Washington, D.C., where they're averaging almost 2,000 consults per month for behavioral health, as well as 200 consults for, per month for neurosurgery. And then the other areas in Fort Benning, Georgia, and Fort Lewis, Washington, doing a variety of pediatric and mental health consultations. All of this represents over 40,000 consults per year in clinical medicine and it's separate and distinct from the hundreds of thousands of radiology images that we move every year as well from one site to the other. So I, what I want to show you on this slide is a fairly rich network of consultations going on between our major medical centers, our hospitals in the United States, as well as hospitals overseas. Regarding traumatic brain injury, we're standing up a program here that extends from Germany throughout the United States and all the way out to the Pacific Theater. The map represents the regional medical commands for the United States Army. And the slide is primarily to show you that we've got a $37 million investment in this program where we're going to be doing uh, a multidisciplinary approach for traumatic brain injury that looks at both neurology, neurosurgery, mental health, psychological health, as well as rehabilitative medicine consults. And as this program stands up uh, across the Army, we'll be hopefully averaging another 10 or 20,000 consults easily uh, for this program in addition to the 40,000 that we're doing already per year. In addition for traumatic brain injury, we're standing up across the uh, eastern part of the United States to start off with a cell phone project where we're using cell phones to uh, uh, push information onto the service member's cell phone to help give them reminders about clinic appointments, reminders about medications they should be taking, as well as uh, ask the service member on their own personal cell phone questions that can be text messaged to them and then they upload those messages to a central server where we have case managers and platoon sergeants interacting with the service members on a regular daily basis. And again, this is a $2.4 million effort. We have uh, just made the contract award uh, in October and we hope to start executing this project uh, sometime in the November uh, time frame. I'd like to shift gears from what we're doing in the United States and focus now on operational telemedicine. This picture is to show you the levels of care that we provide in a deployed setting such as Iraq or Afghanistan. What I'd like to highlight is starting on the bottom right and then working your way up to the top left of the picture you see the different echelons of care starting with level one which is where the, the initial point of injury occurs and then the service member is evacuated back to the different echelons of care. Right now we're focusing telemedicine primarily at the level two, the of, of forward surgical hospital, and the level three facility, the combat support hospital. And we're working to extend the bandwidth <laughs> to improve the communications capability, not only between those level two and level three hospitals, but push the bandwidth down to the level one facility, which is a battalion aid station, where you have very limited capabilities, but we want to expand it just beyond two-way voice and allow some uh, video teleconferencing as well as file transfers of digital images from the far forward echelons of care. With this understanding, it's important to talk about what we're doing in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a very simple email with image attachment system that we stood up. We call it the AKO teleconsultation program. AKO stands for Army Knowledge Online. It's a email system that everyone in the Army utilizes. And all we've done is set up mailboxes for a given medical specialty that has back in the United States, a group mail of maybe anywhere from five to ten physicians that are answering these consults on a regular daily basis. And uh, it's, it's a, a very simple system that requires no training on behalf of the folks in Iraq and Afghanistan. They already know how to do email. They already know how to take a digital image with their own personal digital cameras. 
And so all they do is upload those digital images to an email message and then send that message off to whatever specialty they need, whether it's dermatology, infectious disease, ophthalmology, cardiology, etc. I'm going to show you the, the 19 different specialties that we currently have in place as well as go over a little more detail on this particular system. The beauty of the system is that we've done now over 4,700 consults over the last four and a half years and the average response time is now under five hours. Uh, it has received very strong favorable response from the deployed providers. The key to making this prog program successful, however, is the fact that we have in Texas, in the United States, a, uh, a program manager that makes sure that every consult that is sent from Iraq or Afghanistan is seen by him and ensures that we get an answer back to the referring provider within a very short period of time. So again, the, the consult manager says serves as the medical controller 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have several people working with him to back him up. We're sending primarily JPEG images, digital images. Sometimes we send PDF files. The size of those files can vary from two to, from two to 15 uh, megabytes, for example. Each case has an assigned identification number. We answer all the consults within 24 hours, and as you'll see the data, we actually answer it all within five hours and we generate monthly reports. So again, this uh, figure is meant to show you how it works. You start in the top left, a deployed provider sends an email message. It goes through the email to the consult manager as well as directly to a mail group, for example, dermatology. The dermatologists know that on any given day, one of them is on call, so they are very attentive to answering the mail very quickly, which gives us that quick five-hour turnaround time. The dermatologist would type in the answer and send it back to the referring provider. The consult manager keeps a copy of that and keeps track of how long it took to answer the consult, where the consults are coming from, as well as other statistics that I'll share with you in just a minute. Here's a list of 19 clinical specialties that we have s stood up. And within the last month, we've just added dental medicine with six dental subspecialties all embedded under this dental consult laboratory medicine, as well as sleep. There's uh, a variety of sleep disturbances that occur with deployed uh, service members, and so we found it uh, important to add this particular type of clinical specialty to our pulmonary service to get uh, uh, consults back to the referring provider for soldiers with sleep disturbance problems. This summary slide shows you that for 19 specialties, we've done now just under 4,700 consults. This data goes through um, October uh, 31st of this year. We've prevented some evacuations, which is an important metric to follow. We've also facilitated some evacuations, 168 that you see here. We have now have over 1,300 different healthcare providers who have used this system in Iraq and Afghanistan. And again, we also have over 600 consults that you see in this one uh, figure of uh, international use for patients that are either local nationals uh, such as Iraqi uh, military and police force or Afghanistan local nationals. The average reply time, again, is five hours and eight minutes. But you can see that so far for the calendar year 2008, we've averaged just under five hours. And for October, it was four hours and 52 minutes. So we're very proud of the response time that we're able to provide. And we're also very interested in the international use of the system. And I'll speak more to that in, the, in a few seconds here. Uh, this slide is to show you how does the data break down. You can see, again, half of all our consults are dermatology. This kind of email system with JPEG image attachment lends itself nicely to the field of dermatology since we don't deploy dermatologists normally. Dermatology is a highly used clinical specialty. We can also see that in well below dermatology at 9% usage is infectious disease followed by ophthalmology. Uh, by location, you can see that almost uh, over two-thirds of our consults are coming from Iraq, just over 10% from Afghanistan, and 4% from Kuwait. For the month of October, we had uh, almost 15% of our consults coming from deployed Navy ships at sea. I'd also like to highlight that this system is also used in terms of what types of patients. You can see that just over half of our patients are Army. We also have the Marine Corps and the Navy using our system, as well as the Air Force. The other important point to note is that 10% of all of our consults are for non-combatants, such as local nationals that I mentioned earlier. 
In terms of measuring effectiveness, we feel that this very simple, inexpensive email uh, capability has improved access to specialty care, which has been demonstrated across all specialties. We've either avoided or facilitated medical evacuations out of theater, again, an important metric to keep an eye on. And we also feel that we've elevated the quality of care by having more than one specialty involved in answering these types of questions coming from deployed providers in very austere environments. In addition, we've, we feel that we've optimized medical resources in theater where the consult manager knows that there are certain key specialties in parts of the country, and rather than evacuating somebody out of the country, we can oftentimes refer them from Balad, Iraq, for example, down to Baghdad if we know that there is a, a particular specialty available. Uh, in terms of this system uh, being used for international patients, uh, one of the hats I wear is I chair a NATO telemedicine expert team, and we've been working now for almost two years in trying to offer this very simple email teleconsultation system to deploy NATO forces in Afghanistan. And this is being offered to NATO at no cost for all 19 clinical specialties that I showed you earlier. And from these early discussions, we've drafted a memorandum of understanding that memorandum of understanding has been signed uh, by both the United States Army Medical Command as well as the NATO forces in Brussels. And we hope to deploy this capability to Afghanistan either in the December or January timeframe. The key is that, again, we have multiple nations supporting the military operations in Afghanistan. And to provide this capability to the NATO forces where the consults will be sent back to the United States United States physicians will answer the consults and send a response back to the NATO forces. We feel will help improve care across all the different nations providing medical coverage in this important area of the world right now. This agreement is voluntary. NATO can participate uh, if they choose. Uh, some nations in the NATO forces in Afghanistan already have their own telemedicine capabilities. Again, we will not charge for this support. We're offering this capability on a six to 12 month interim basis and see how much it's being utilized. The NATO nations need to provide the computer and the internet access as well as the digital cameras. And again, in talking to the NATO countries, they already have this capability at all of those NATO facilities. And as I mentioned, the memorandum of agreement has been signed in November. In terms of showing some examples of this very simple system, here's a case that occurred several years ago now where a service member had a, a, a lesion on his skin. And you can see that had this not been uh, looked at with teledermatology, this person may have stayed in country for six months to 15 months and missed the, an important diagnosis, which is in this case a uh, diagnosis of malignant melanoma, a very aggressive form of skin cancer. So this, we felt, was a very important example of the value of this system for dermatology. But we have other cases, as this slide shows you. You could see that um, uh, when you deploy, uh, especially early in the war in Iraq, we saw a lot of leishmania. We also see uh, a lot of local national uh, patients with very severe skin problems. And again, the system for teledermatology has, we felt, been a very important tool in helping to improve care for not only our military, but also those of the local nationals. Here's a, a, a helicopter pilot where he was grounded because his EKG showed some flip T waves in his inferior leads. And you could see that 42 minutes after this consult was sent to our cardiology uh, uh, consult system, an answer came back saying that those flipped T waves in lead three are nonspecific and there was no reason to ground this aviator. And so, um, again, you can see the follow-up physician's comments saying this is outstanding and a big relief for all involved. In addition to doing very simple email with JPEG images, what I want to show you on this slide is the fact that we have a very robust teleradiology program in Iraq and Afghanistan where we send images from those countries to include Kuwait back to the European Regional Medical Command at the Launchstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany. Uh, this is a very robust radiology system that right now is limited by the amount of bandwidth. As you can imagine, a CAT scan is about a 60 to 120 megabyte file, and we need a large pipe to move those high-density files through. And uh, just uh, 
uh, about uh, three months from now, we hope to have implemented improved bandwidth, dedicated T1, or dedicated 1.54 megabits per second at each of our major level two and level three combat support hospitals in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a big, a big uh, accomplishment, one that we're very proud of, and one that will improve the usage of telemedicine from Iraq and Afghanistan back to Germany and the U.S. for not only radiology, but all the other specialties to include video teleconferencing for mental health consults. I'm going to change gears here a little bit and tell you about another important program. When we send all these medical hospitals out to austere areas, we have a lot of equipment in those hospitals. So how do we fix the equipment when it breaks? Anyone that's ever done trauma knows that a CAT scan is critical. When that CAT scan machine goes down, who's going to fix it? At these combat support hospitals, we have a range of abilities. We can have a lot of young people going through a 12-week course to fix machinery, only to find out that the kinds of machinery that they have to fix includes not just a multi-million dollar CAT scan, but maybe an oxygen generator or a laboratory machine that will do blood gases, for example. And so the stress placed on those young people to fix expensive equipment can be a challenge. So we're doing telemedicine now from the United States into these combat support hospitals to try to fix the equipment at a distance as well. So this uh, cartoon shows you how the scenario is stood up. The whole point is we want to optimize our resources by having engineers in the United States as well as the civilian company engineers who make the equipment, such as the CAT scanners, the oxygen generators, etc., all involved in a rich network that then goes through the internet and then tunnels into the serial port of each of these uh, uh, medical devices that you see listed here. It's a secure connection. It increases the uptime of these machineries and makes sure that they're working all the time, and it decreases the maintenance cost. It's important to note that we're not just trying to push new patches onto this equipment, but we're also trying to sense it on a regular basis to, to, to diagnose earlier if the machinery is starting to fail or if there's soft software problems that are occurring. Right now, we are in the process of rolling this capability out. We have this deployed to the CAT scans in Germany. Right now, we're rolling this out to the six sites you see listed here in Iraq and for the types of CAT scans you see listed, both Philips, Toshiba, and the MX-80s uh, throughout Iraq. Uh, it's going to be one secure access point as opposed to multiple access points, and again, uh, up till about six months ago, there was no solution in place. We are now at the point of rolling this out throughout Iraq, and I think once we get this in place, it's going to improve how we take care of patients by making sure that the equipment that we need is working. I'd like to change topics and talk about now the operating room. I know many of you in the audience are surgeons. And again, how do you as a surgeon, let's say you have, you're a general surgeon and you have somebody coming in with severe head trauma and you have to do a craniotomy. How comfortable do you feel in doing a craniotomy when perhaps your clinical practice back in your home environment is one where you're doing mostly, let's say, breast or abdomen or um, uh, minimally invasive surgery? And you can see the challenges in this. What we are trying to do is develop a very simple user interface to allow us to do over the internet telesurgical mentoring where a surgeon in Iraq can talk to a surgical specialist back in the United States over the internet using telestration and whiteboard capability to allow them, uh, those surgeons in Iraq, important subspecialty support for difficult cases. The, again, the need is the fact, as I mentioned, that we oftentimes don't have enough neurosurgeons, urologists, um, uh, uh, ENT physicians, let's say, and we rely on our general surgeon to do everything that needs to be done. There are times when having that kind of dialogue with a surgical uh, specialist would be important. So what we've designed is a very simple, lightweight system that runs over the internet, designed to meet the needs of the surgeon, and we have a prototype that is being built, and it, it will be going to Iraq in January 2009. The way it looks is depicted in this figure here. Over on your right, you see that the surgeon is wearing a head camera, and also in the lights of the operating room, we're putting another camera 
with a laser pointer that will allow the surgeon back in the United States to drive the laser pointer pointing to areas in the operative field that the surgeon in Iraq can now look at. So we've got a green laser light shining into a red bloody operative field and the surgeon's head camera can give a better view for those areas of the operative field that don't lend themselves easily to the overhead camera. Everything is done over a variety of servers with robot controls. Everything runs over the internet and the specialist located on the left of this picture can then draw on certain pictures to allow the surgeon in theater to see specifically what they're talking about. This is the interface. You can see it's a quadrant of the top left is the video image, bottom left is the telestration window. We have shared documents on the bottom right, and then the control features are the top right. How does this look? You can see here we've already have the software developed, and, and here's an example on the top left is a pig undergoing a craniotomy. Uh, you can see the operative field in the bottom left and the control features over here on the right. Here is an example of the, the first prototype of the camera and the laser pointer in the overhead lamp. This is an example of the telestration features where surgeons can write, they can do a freeze frame capture of the operative field and write on it and send it back to the surgeon in Iraq for specific guidance. These are the engineers in California that are building the system with an example of the pig there in the bottom right, testing the capabilities. And again, it's a wonderful example of where engineers and surgeons have all come together to develop something which we think will improve the quality of care for deployed uh, service members. This uh, usability of this robotic system for robotic surgical telementoring has undergone some preliminary studies in, an, in a laboratory setting. Uh, Dr. Sloan Guy uh, from the U.S. Army, he's a thoracic surgeon, is the principal investigator for this project. And again, what they've demonstrated is that it is feasible and it does provide value added to a surgeon to have this kind of reach back capability. Taking that same capability, what we're trying to do through a company in California is take the same capability where in touch health from Santa Barbara, California, has a robot with two-way audio video, and they're sub-licensing their technology to Stryker, a, a producer of a lot of operative room equipment. And what this picture here will show you is how in an operating room, you see a surgeon sta uh, standing next to a patient. You'll have suspended from the ceiling, again, two-way voice, two-way video. This is the surgeon remotely looking at the vital signs in the room of the patient, looking at all the monitoring, talking to the surgeon. Um, in this particular case, you also have a laser pointer that will point into the operative field, that will point to specific physiological findings. And this capability will be developed uh, in conjunction with Stryker and InTouch Health and become a product, hopefully, in the uh, mid part of 2009. That same company makes this particular device you see here, which is a robot that stands about five and a half feet tall with a camera and an audio system that can be driven with a remote joystick over the internet. This is the robot that we have in the United States Army at the Institute for Surgical Research in San Antonio, Texas. Here you can see it has the traditional Army uh, coloring to it. And on the uh, robot itself is Dr. Kevin Chung, the principal investigator. We published in 2007 the value of having this type of capability either in the intensive care unit or in the operating room. The whole point is to extend surgeons, doctors, capabilities from either the hospital, their office, or home into a variety of settings into a hospital such as the emergency room, the ward, or even in the, uh, the ICUs, and all over the internet internet which provides very robust capability. What we're trying to do is extend, if you will, taking advantage of the awake clock in Baghdad to be able to push far west as much as possible, link into people who are awake and doing business. As you can see, when it's, uh, when it's 8 o'clock at night in Baghdad, it's 12 o'clock in the afternoon in Washington. And if it's 12 o'clock in Washington, it's 9 o'clock in the morning in Fort Lewis, Washington, which is Madigan Army Medical Center, and then pushing it across Hawaii. Between Hawaii and Baghdad, we now have almost 13 different time zones, 13-hour difference, which will, again, take advantage of 
surgeons and doctors who are awake in Hawaii at a time when Baghdad is asleep. But as you know, in trauma, patients come in at all hours of the day. And again, we're trying to provide this military critical care network. Again, using this robot to push information from the ICU or the operating room back to somebody who's awake. We have three of these robots currently uh, deployed to San Antonio, Texas. I already showed you a picture of that one. We have one in Tacoma, Washington, where Madigan Army Medical Center is, as well as in Rider Trauma, which is a large trauma center in Miami. This is where we train our U.S. Army trauma teams before they deploy to Iraq, and again, to give them the capability and the familiarity of using the robot in those settings. This is the robot, as I showed you earlier, in San Antonio, Texas. And again, what they did in 2007 was a prospective observational study for 15 months where they used the robot in the intensive care unit, and they decided to see how well could they access the robot from home, and what was the satisfaction between doctors and nurses who used the robot. Here you could see the robot in the intensive care unit standing next to a ventilator. It's important that the picture on that robot is Dr. Kevin Chung, who's driving the robot from a joystick from his home or his office. And he can drive it into the ICU or anywhere else in the hospital. In this particular case, he's checking ventilator settings. Here he has the robot in the intensive care unit talking to the patient, or not in this case, the patient's on a ventilator, but talking to the nurse to make sure that um, uh, good quality care is being delivered. So what did the prospective observational study show? Well, for the eight clinicians that were driving the robot, they had an 89% success rate in accessing the robot the very first attempt for a total of nearly 300 interventions. You could see that most of the interventions that they used the robot for, just over a third were intravenous fluids, medicine changes. They used 13% of the time for routine surgical rounds, ICU rounds. 15% was to make changes to the ventilator. Another 15% was for continuous renal replacement therapy or dialysis, and then supervising procedures by residents with the staff physician at a distance. In terms of satisfaction, you could see among doctors, nurses, residents, and family, on the 10-point Likert scale, everyone had at least an 88.1% satisfaction in terms of using the robot. In terms of how well did it advanced patient care among the 75 doctors, nurses, and residents who used it. Everyone either strongly agreed or agreed that it did help advance patient care with just a very, very small, small group that felt it, it was neutral. In terms of whether the robot actually saved me time, you can see that the 30 physicians and residents that used it, that the vast majority felt strongly that it uh, did save time uh, and again, I think that's critical in terms of outcome-based metrics. It either saves me time, saves money, or improves clinical outcomes. And so time is critical, as you know, in the ICU and the OR. In terms of asking the question to 99 providers, is the robot no better than a telephone? What, does having that video image really improve the care? You could see that the vast majority felt that it was better than just the telephone. Uh, by either disagreeing or strongly disagreeing with the statement above. In addition, how good was the video? You could see they all felt it was either very good or good. In terms of how good was the audio, the audio wasn't as good as the video, where you could see a, a smaller, a larger group rather felt it was average. Again, looking at the video, you could see that there was a smaller group who felt that the, av the video quality was only average. So again, I think the audio, the video seems to be uh, good to very good. The, it seems to save time. And again, here is Dr. Kevin Chung, um, internist, intensivist, sitting at his desk with his joystick using the robot. And when he deployed to Iraq, he also used the robot from his desk in Iraq, driving the robot back in Texas. So in closing, I'd like to again thank you all for this opportunity to talk to you about some of the exciting work we're doing in telemedicine. Let me finish by just making some summary points. We feel that remote consultation is providing mission and cost benefits to our deployed U.S. forces, that there are very simple and inexpensive teleconsultation systems that are out there, and we're using them as much as possible. Bandwidth is the rate-limiting resource for operational telehealth, and a, an approved solution is awaiting implementation, which I hope to have in place by March of 2009. 
which will increase dramatically the, the, the size of files that we can move between Iraq, Afghanistan, back to the United States. We feel that we have measurable levels of effectiveness for telehealth, and it's been demonstrated in a variety of deployed facilities now for many years. In terms of future applications, I shared with you some of them, such as the remote surgical mentoring, the medical maintenance of equipment. Uh, and again, with more bandwidth, it's only a matter of time before we, we make a seamless uh, connection between overseas forces and the United States and that a military telesurgical network is being actively developed to take advantage of the awake clock so that whenever somebody in a part of the world has a question, there's always somebody awake and able to answer the consult, not only from a telephone, from an audio perspective, but also with important imagery. I thank you again for the opportunity. I regret that I'm not there to take direct questions. However, if you, if you do need to reach me, my email address is listed here. Ron.Porapatich at AMED, A M E D D, dot Army, dot Mill. And my telephone number, as you see, is 301 619 7967. Uh, thank you very much. Muchas gracias y uh, uh, adios. And uh, I'm sorry, I think that it just shows that whoever was filming him didn't really pay attention because if they just moved the camera a little bit closer to the slides, it would have been better than, than, than where we saw, but uh, uh, I have a copy of the DVD, so if anyone wants, I can give it to you all uh, for have it. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Ronald Merrill, uh, who is absolutely, totally, 100% responsible for my being involved in telemedicine. Uh, and it just shows that if you have a good mentor, uh, eventually you will, uh, you'll, you know, you do what the mentor does. Uh, and we all aspire to be what our mentors are, and uh, Dr. Merrill is uh, one of those uh, uh, gentlemen. He uh, is a professor of surgery at the University, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. Prior to that, he was at Yale University as a professor. That's where we were my chairman. Uh, I graduated under his uh, uh, leadership. And uh, he's probably single-handed uh, educated more telemedicine people than anyone else in the world. At one point, I was in a meeting when they were 15. It was one of these uh, Army, U.S. Army uh, meetings on telemedicine. And there were 11, uh, there were 12 speakers. From 12 speakers, 11 were his students. So it was really good to see, uh, to, and, and he was at number 12. So uh, it was uh, really good, good to see him. Uh, I asked him to talk on, uh, on uh, telemedicine for disaster, which then leads to Antonio's uh, follow-up, how to do it, how can we prevent it, and then we go to ICU. So Antonio has two talks, and uh, Dr. Mel has one. Why don't we listen to Dr. Mel, and then we can take one break. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you. I'm Dr. Ron Merrill from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the Pan American Trauma Association at your meeting in Brazil. I'm very sorry I can't be with you today. In fact, I'm, I'm in Pakistan uh, working on some telemedicine projects. Telemedicine has been a theme for my research and professional activities for a good many years. And today I want to speak to you about the role of tele telemedicine in response to disasters. First image, please. Telemedicine is the use of telecommunications and information technology in order to support the healthcare delivery at a distant site. How might that apply to disasters? Next, please. Disaster is an interesting word in terms of its etymology. Disaster is a loss of the alignment with the stars. In other words, falling out of favor. And certainly that still communicates to us today in terms of what disaster means to us. It's a sudden disruption of services due to natural or human action. A sudden expansion of the demand for services by casualties. It's a sudden loss of infrastructure, even with services intact. 
And in all instances, it's an abrupt imbalance between services and demand. Next, please. This is Sputnik 1, launched in 1957, that introduced the possibility of very long-range, instantaneous, almost instantaneous communications. And the use of satellites has greatly changed the way we can view catastrophe or impending catastrophe and our response to catastrophe in the world. Next, please. We all know that satellites can be used to look at the acute weather events, look at chronic weather trends, patterns. Satellites can be look, used to look at seismic events, climate changes, war preparations, and specifically in disasters. Satellites can do some prediction with regard to natural disasters. Where is a fire going? Has a tsunami begun? It can do a great deal for disaster assessment. What are the resources we'll need? When do we need them? Where should they go? And certainly, I think more specific for the practice of medicine, satellite and telemedicine can support disaster decisions, the logistics, and the coordination of our response. Next, please. In the realm of prediction, hurricanes, cyclones, such as Katrina that struck uh, my own country a number of years ago, can be done pretty well by watching the patterns of the storm as it approaches an area that's inhabited. Next, please. Tsunamis can be marginally predicted. They move so fast that it still may not be especially helpful in terms of looking ahead, but every few minutes count in terms of gaining a few extra feet in height above sea level as a tsunami approaches. Next, please. The greatest use of satellites and telecommunications, and may I say introducing telemedicine, is in the realm of assessment. What was the intensity of the event? at a time when even the news services are not there, at a time when telephony is out of the question, all the infrastructure has fallen, all the infrastructure has been destroyed by an event of war. What is the intensity of the event? What is its scope? Intensity be at one place, how many buildings are down, has the dam burst? What is the scope? How broad a front are we expecting? An assessment of the resources. What's left? What's left in the way of hospitals? And we can see that from satellite. We can see what's going on. What are the liabilities in terms of bringing in support personnel or launching a human relief? Is it safe yet? How do we get there? What are our liabilities in terms of summoning an appropriate response? And finally, what is the status of the telecommunications infrastructure? We haven't heard from an area. We gather that there's been an earthquake based upon uh, seismic uh, sensors. What is the situation there? What is the telephony? What is the telecom? What do they have? Next, please. With regard to decision support, I might expand upon that statement for just a moment. We're talking about providing just-in-time telecommunications by dropping things in, establishing almost always communications through satellite telephony so that people can know what they need to know to make a local decision and inform a regional decision. Next, please. With regard to decision support, we deal with the logistics, moving things around, organizing a response, information management, gathering the information relative to a disaster, supporting the interaction of command and control with the far forward or first responder groups, decision support with regard to implementing further telecommunications and establishing an information continuum so that the fractured, broken, 
interface of the disaster and its hopeful responders is in complete electronic continuum and information flow back to command and center, command and control, and back to those centers of information that can inform the providers with what they need in order to provide appropriate and effective early response. And then finally, decision support has to do with resource assignment. How many trucks, how many doctors, how many nurses, having great masses of relief workers 50 miles or 100 kilometers from the site of need is rather frustrating to know that you're this close, but you're not where you need to be, or you don't have the elements necessary to provide the care intended. Next, please. Disasters, of course, can be chronic. In other words, the disaster could be a problem of ongoing uh, road issues, a lack of uh, the means to get from one place to another. This is a truck that's used as a mobile operating unit uh, in Ecuador. Uh, the trucks that have to go over these these bad places or the, the, the pre-existing infrastructure deficiencies have to be tough. They have to be able to uh, traverse the terrain and get there uh, in a way that'll work. Trucks as opposed to helicopters, I suppose. Next, please. The first responder needs a toolkit that's a little better than a radio, a little better, in order to support information transfer. Uh, in this particular setup that you see, you're looking at a unit that we deployed in Kenya where there was no power grid, so we had a solar panel. Uh, we had some sensors to find out how people were doing, patients were doing. Telecommunications was by a, a satellite phone, 64 kilobits per second. Uh, there was software to manage the information that was being gathered and transmitted, and we had what I would call assisted autonomy. The first responders were the only ones who could do anything, but they could have assistance in their autonomy by an information continuum. Next, please. One of the earliest experiences in using uh, large-scale telecommunications in a disaster was in Armenia, uh, after the earthquake there in 1988, perhaps 70,000 people died. Uh, it was a difficult time in a geopolitical sense. Uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration of the United States collaborated with uh, the, the Soviet Union to put in satellite telecommunications, and they could not be put in early. It took time, a lot of time, well, three months. However, the unit was used to provide uh, an electronic continuum to the caregivers there so that over the coming months they could reassemble from a very fractured and damaged situation a medical response that would work and put the country back onto uh, a secure and independent footing for healthcare delivery. Next, please. Very important in using telemedicine for disasters or any other purpose is to look back analyze, consider, think about what you accomplished, try to measure it. And this was one of the early publications in that regard where we look back at the Armenia uh, disaster and what was learned. Next, please. You can also think of the first responder as needing an information portal, an information manager. With regard to disaster preparedness, our particular group here in Richmond spent a good bit of time working with the uh, Homeland Security people after 9-11, 2001, to think about what could be done to empower the first responder with first-rate telecommunications beyond the radio. And certainly what came to mind was uh, instant satellite uh, communications, pre-positioning of resources, arming, empowering the first responder with the tools at the time of the catastrophe so that they could be in a complete information support situation and transmission situation as soon as the units arrived at the point of a disaster. Next, please.
The information to be provided is not simply the protocols in which the first responders have been so completely trained, but to provide them information for new things, new kinds of injuries, new kinds of infectious threats, new kinds of poisons, toxins. Next, please. And in that setting, a command and control center could know from the field what was going on by video, by sensors, by data collection and entry into a digital format, and then send back to the first responder the appropriate algorithm for what may be a novel or a rare situation. Next, please. Information support after Hurricane Katrina took as much time as it took to drive there from Richmond down to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. That was about two days in order to set up a telecommunications situation at the Stennis NASA Space Center to provide relief for about 3,000 people who found themselves there. Prepositioning of those assets would have been wonderful. Having them at a place you knew about and giving an instruction to Dr. Merrill to get down to Mississippi uh, still took two days, but it was nice to know where the assets were. Next, please. I want to tell you briefly about a telemedicine experience in Pakistan. Under the auspices of USAID, uh, my, my group had been working with counterparts and Rabul Pindi teaching telemedicine and getting ready for what we thought was the support of primary care by telemedicine events so that medicine could become comprehensive and integrated between or bridge the disconnect between primary care and uh, more advanced medical services. In uh, the months preceding the earthquake in Pakistan in 2005, we trained a good many people in the elements of telemedicine. Next, please. In this program, we had uh, a curriculum. Uh, we had people who had passed the course. Uh, it was uh, a course that had trained about 30 people uh, in a wide range of specialties. Uh, and each trainee had prepared a project in his or her area of interest. And it was based upon a tentative network with rural sites. Next, please. The, the information had been organized for this through uh, websites. So it was a web-based curriculum, a web-based area, uh, 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 arena for communication among the sites. Next, please. However, the strata beneath the mountains of the Hindu Kush uh, no no uh, master and they shifted in a uh, Richter 8.4 earthquake that killed again about 70,000 people. Next please. The epicenter was near Balakot. Next please. It destroyed the infrastructure of telephony, water, sanitation, roads, and created a terrible isolation for a large number of people who had survived but were in peril because of their isolation and sudden subtraction of resources. Next, please. The, um, the people who were there were courageous. They did their best to help themselves. Next, please. They quickly moved into camps. The people who had been hurt were uh, in a the prospect of evacuation, next please. Helicopters and massive research or rescue uh, elements were brought to bear from the U.S. and many, many other countries. Next please. Emergency medical facilities were established in the mountains. But now let's talk about telemedicine. Next please. I corresponded with my colleagues there to express my, my sorrow uh, after the earthquake and to ask if there was anything I could do from the great distance of Richmond and uh, we would get back to the things we had been working on in telemedicine at another time. Well, 
the message I got back was that the trainees and some of the medical students at Robert Penny Medical College had come to the telemedicine people and said, we took the course or we heard about the course. Can't we take the things that were important in telemedicine up to the mountains and let's get started and help? So they had 10 satellite phones. They provided the medical students with a backpack, a satellite phone, camera, sensors, software, maybe some food, and sent them off to the mountains. They sent them out to the relief clinic that was pretty much at ground zero in Balakot. Uh, they uh, started screening patients and began to interact with the relief groups that were coming in very quickly but had very poor uh, communications from one to the other. They directed patients down to Rawalpindi Medical College and overall 6,000 patients came to this 1,000 bed hospital over the next days. The students figured out that these people can't stay down here while they recover from their injuries, so they made arrangements to provide a telemedicine clinic uh, back in the mountains so that the patients could be sent there to recover in an electronic continuum with their caregivers from the university hospital, from Holy Family Hospital. They could go back to their families, their livestock, their possessions, which brought great solace to the injured individuals. Next, please. The telemedicine clinic eventually had a banner. Next, please. And various assets were brought in. This is me with uh, Professor Kahn from the medical school. Next, please. And telemedicine went on vigorously for nearly five months to provide follow-up. This is Dr. Azar Rafiq assisting in a telemedicine conference uh, back to uh, Rabalpindi medical school with the youngster who obviously has an extremity injury. Next, please. Balakot was badly damaged uh, the epi near the epicenter, which was uh, some, some miles away. Next, please. These are some of the children who really don't know that there's anything wrong except maybe it's lunchtime. Uh, what we found was that one of the best built buildings in Balakot was the hospital. It collapsed and killed essentially every doctor, nurse, and health worker in the town at a time when the town desperately needed help. So the import of personnel was fairly obvious. Children suffered greatly. Their school collapsed. 600 children died in the middle school there. Next, please. It affected young people badly, disorientation. Uh, sometimes you have to tell people what to do in a time of disaster. Telemedicine can help in that regard by providing educational materials, and now we know can provide interventional psychotherapy and psychological response. Next, please. I always find that the old people do best in disasters. Seek them out, put them to work, they'll bring calm and they'll help bring things back to normalcy. Next, please. Extremely useful. Telemedicine, telecommunications during a time of reconstruction. Let me talk for a moment about the technology and then we'll be done with this brief transmission. Next slide, please. What I want you to do is to consider what are the kinds of telecommunication tools that we have and which ones light up with regard to utility and uh, utilization at a time of disaster. The HF radio, VHF, the police, radios and so forth are at the top of the list because they are certainly the most commonly employed for emergency communications at a time of disaster or urgency. The HF radio, uh, the HAM radio, can only summon a bandwidth of 100 to 400 bits per section, bits per second. The VHF can get up to 2400 to 9600 bits per second, does well for voice, not well for data transfer, not very well for images. Now we have worked with uh, the VHF radio frequencies and capacities to slow scan 
and send images and to send text data, but it's not quick. The cellular networks do pretty well in the the old uh, the old version at about 9600 uh, bits per second. However, in disaster, very often the cell towers fall, and if you lose one cell, you lose the continuity. Furthermore, as we learned in the New York disaster of 9/11, the cells were saturated almost immediately and became not very good. In fact, useless in terms of providing communication. As we move forward to second generation and third generation cellular telephony, the transmission rate gets very good, very, very good. And for chronic delivery of communications, high bandwidth or fairly high bandwidth, uh, this is a system that is thought of as ideal. However, it's quite vulnerable to overloading and to disruption by collapse of the towers. Next, please. The low Earth orbit satellite is pretty cheap, but it doesn't get you up terribly far in the, in the uh, transmission rate. Next is the geosynchronous, which is the technology I would like to emphasize. This is used by the news services, 64 kilobits per second. You can link them together and have even higher, 128 kilobits is what you would really like to have for fluid video and, and secure audio. 64, however, is pretty good, and you can work with that. This situation, if you can get the geosynchronous uh, video phones to the site, is very good for providing what we think of as telemedicine consultation, logistics, decision support, analysis, analysis, and so forth, to a bad place in a short period of time. But if the satellite phones are being flown in from Paris and the disaster is in the Punjab, distance and time become barriers. Next, please. Uh, no, sorry. Let me go back to that one. The wireless Ethernet. Let me talk about this for a minute. It provides huge, huge bandwidth and may be exactly where we're going next with regard to disaster preparedness. Now, because it's wireless, you have to be within 30 meters to get to a node. You can get a five kilometer spread, but you have to bring in the nodes to support in a short period of time. They can be driven out, flown out, so forth, and then bounce to whatever. To, the, to some intact form of telecommunications. But although right now, I'd have to say that the satellite phone is the best we're going to get, the wireless with prompt regional support is probably the vector toward which we're heading. Next, please. Well, I just wanted to show you this, some of the configurations that have been used in disasters in recent times. And I'd like to think that as we plan, anticipate the inevitability of various kinds of disasters, that the inclusion of telemedicine is not a difficult decision. Because of the amount of decision support, logistics, electronic information, information management, etc., the inclusion of telemedicine to supplement what we can discern from satellite imaging, to me, is a very easy decision and over the last number of years has, I believe, proven itself in those situations where the telecommunications were there by satellite phone in a timely manner. Next, please. Let me conclude by saying that telemedicine is routinely supported by terrestrial telephony and Internet in areas that are developed and intact. We use telemedicine a lot in the world. With the disruption of services in disaster, routine telecommunications are typically an early casualty. Cellular systems are especially vulnerable because of saturation. Disaster can reduce any community to the dependent and vulnerable state otherwise associated with the developing world. Disaster communications based upon radio are reliable and have worked for 50 years with their limitations. 
but the amount of information needed to support medicine cannot be transmitted by HF or VHF radio. A robust, well-practiced satellite system can replace the information void otherwise associated with disaster. And finally, finally, importantly, prior training and pre-positioning of telecommunications can make telemedicine an immediate and reliable adjunct to disaster management. Again, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today. I wish you every success in your meeting, and I am especially pleased by this session's interest in telemedicine. Good day. Uh, he helped me. Uh, I went to, during the war in Kosovo, uh, I was a chief resident, and I went to his office. I said, I want to quit. <clears throat> I want to go to war in the Balkans. And he said, if you quit, I'm going to fire you. If you just, if you go for one day, I'm going to fire you. And the reason he did that, because he didn't want me to get killed in the war. <laughs> Not that he didn't really want me to go there. I had three more weeks to finish. And by Yale criteria, if I had missed those three weeks, I would not be able to graduate. So he didn't let me do that. I was very disappointed. I was, I was very upset. And I went uh, home. I bought a ticket the first day after graduation to go back to war. But then in the meantime, war ended. <laughs> I was very upset that war ended. I really wanted to go to war. Uh, and we wanted to use some of the technology that we were using at Yale, uh, and especially that Armenia bridge that he alluded to. So. He's a great man, great guy to work with. Uh, my, he's a, my mentor. I talk to him basically every day. So he retired from surgery. He does not practice surgery anymore. At age 63, he said, I want to quit while my hands are stable and I don't shake and I don't have uh, Parkinson's disease and I'm in good shape. <laughs> so I think it's a good deal. All right. Uh, any question of any of those programs that he mentioned? Because I can probably talk about any of those programs. We were, we worked together in most of those.